optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just seeing a broken time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Peloton, which I've been using probably for about a year now. Peloton is a cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right into your home. You can also do on-demand, which is what I do. We'll come back to that. So you don't have to worry about fitting classes into a busy schedule or making it to a studio or gym with a hectic or unpredictable commute. I, for instance, have a Peloton bike right in my master bedroom at home, and it's one of the first things I do many mornings. I wake up, I meditate for a bit, then I knock out a short 20-minute ride in my undies, hard to do that at the gym, take a shower, and I'm in higher gear for the rest of the day. It's really convenient and has become something that I look forward to. So you have a lot of options. For one, if you like, you can ride live with thousands of other riders across the country on an interactive leaderboard to keep you motivated. There are also up to 14 new classes added every day with more than 8,000 classes on demand. And you can pick based on length, 45 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, music, hip hop, rock and roll, or say low impact versus high intensity or interval. You can pick the class structure and style that works for you. And in my case, I quite like Matt Wilpers, and I tend to do on-demand and listen to a lot of and watch many of the same classes over and over, but I'm kind of promiscuous and also enjoy classes from a lot of the other instructors. They have Peloton, an amazing roster of incredible instructors in New York City with a whole range of styles and personalities, so you can find what you're in the mood for. You also get real-time metrics that you can use to track your performance over time, and that will help I would say catalyze you to beat your personal best. Now, that all sounds good, right? Gamification, yada, yada, yada. I didn't think that it would work for me or in any way incentivize me, but they really 100% hit the nail on the head. I was very, very impressed with how motivating it was. And it worked tremendously to keep me pushing, uh, which quite honestly takes a fair amount. I can get quite lazy, particularly with anything that edges on endurance, which is kind of more than five reps of anything for me. So... Check it out. Discover this cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings the studio experience right to your home. Peloton is offering listeners of this podcast a limited-time offer. Go to OnePeloton.com. That's O-N-E, Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com, and enter the code TIM, all caps, at checkout, and get $100 off of accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. So get a great workout at home anytime you want. Check it out. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the code TIM to get started. This episode is brought to you by LegalZoom, which more than 2 million Americans have used to help start their businesses. Past guests even, such as, well, WordPress lead developer, CEO of Automatic, Matt Mullenweg, now valued at more than a billion dollars, have used LegalZoom to help with their business needs, specifically in his case, to form his company. But... LegalZoom isn't just for launching your business. Their services include everything from helping you to manage changing tax laws, reviewing contracts, creating NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, important stuff, handling lease agreements, and assisting with really any other legal challenge, hurdle, inconvenience that typically takes time and effort away from running your business. The best part is that you won't get charged by the hour because LegalZoom isn't a law firm, so they won't be running the clock up and spinning circles just to raise your bill. Instead, they just ask you to pay one low upfront price for whatever it is that you're looking to get a la carte style. So visit LegalZoom.com and check out their business section for all of their services. And if you want special savings, that's the terminology in the copy that they suggest. I don't know what the special savings is, folks, but it's titillating. If you want special savings, enter promo code TIM, T-I-M, at checkout, capital T, lowercase I-M. Again, take a peek, LegalZoom.com, and enter promo code TIM. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job each episode to interview and deconstruct world-class performers, and or people who are the best at what they do, to tease out the life lessons, habits, tools, and so on that you can hopefully apply to your own lives. And this episode was such a treat for me. I had so much fun, and I was able to interview a living legend, someone I've wanted to interview on this podcast for many years, 
Stanislav Grof. And we went deep, we went long, we went wide. It was everything I hoped it to be. Stanislav Grof, MD, otherwise known as Stan Grof. Stanislav is spelled S-T-A-N-I-S-L-A-V, is a psychiatrist with more than 60 years of experience in research of holotropic states of consciousness. And we'll define what that means in the interview. But suffice to say for now, it is a large and important subgroup of non-ordinary states that have healing, transformative, and evolutionary potential. And we will explore all of that. Previously, he was principal investigator in a psychedelic research program at the Psychiatric Research Institute in Prague, Czechoslovakia, chief of psychiatric research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, assistant professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and scholar in residence at the Esalen Institute. In this very wide-ranging conversation, we cover a whole lot of things, including some stuff that he has not gone over previously. So among others, some of his main takeaways after supervising or guiding roughly 4,500 LSD sessions, that is, LSD-assisted psychotherapy sessions, the place and role of so-called wounded healers, limitations and uses of traditional psychoanalysis and talk therapy, similarities or some similarities between holotropic breathwork and MDMA use, or the applications of MDMA, stories of very odd synchronicities and the seemingly impossible. We get into some very, very uh, hard to explain (laughs) reports and phenomena, to put it very, very lightly. Stan's strangest personal experiences on psychedelics and what Stan believes humanity most needs to overcome division and destruction. Currently, Stan is professor of psychology at CIIS, that's the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, and conducts professional training programs in holotropic breathwork and transpersonal psychology, as well as gives lectures and seminars worldwide. He is one of the founders and chief theoreticians of transpersonal psychology as a field and the founding president of the International Transpersonal Association. ITA. His publications include more than 150 articles in professional journals and books like Psychology of the Future, The Cosmic Game, and Holotropic Breathwork, among many others. You can find him online, and I will link to this and everything in this episode in the show notes at tim.blog forward slash podcast. You can find him online at stanislavgroff.com. Now, one more thing before we get to the interview, and I'll try to keep this short. Please, 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 if you're a listener of this podcast, If you like what you hear, I invite you and uh, ask you, please, to subscribe to the podcast, and you will get notified whenever I release a new episode. For many reasons, and a lot of technical reasons, this is very, very helpful to me and my podcast team. It helps us to get hard-to-reach guests and do much more. It takes 10 to 30 seconds. So all you have to do is search for The Tim Ferriss Show. You can misspell it, doesn't matter, in iTunes or on your phone, in the app you use, like Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Stitcher, CastBox, whatever. When you see my face and The Tim Ferriss Show, click on it and click subscribe. That's it. Super easy. If you can spare the 10 to 30 seconds, thank you for pausing this episode briefly to do that. It really helps us to do bigger and better things for you all. And with that said, please enjoy this interview. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did with the one and only Stan Groff. Stan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor. And before we start, I would like to thank you for everything you have been doing uh, for raising consciousness on this planet. It has been amazing, and it's a great uh, honor and pleasure for me to be on your show. Oh, thank you so much. I could not be more excited to be speaking with you right now. And we said hello via video just a few moments ago. And uh, I certainly have only become more excited to have this conversation uh, because of our our introduction, Jack Cornfield, one of the sweetest humans I know. And uh, I have many questions and many topics. Uh, so thanks, of course, to Jack for making the introduction. And uh, by this time, people would have already heard some of your biographical information that I would have read, but I suppose we should start maybe at the beginning and ask you how you first became interested in psychedelics. Uh, well, the situation was I became initially very excited about psychoanalysis 
And uh, as a result of it, I uh, went to medical school. And in my fourth year of uh, of medical school, I was uh, going to the psychiatric department already as a volunteer to get some, you know, some uh, sense for the for the discipline. And uh, this is where we got from Sandoz a supply of um, ampules of of Delizit, of, of LSD. And it came with a letter uh, talking about the history, about uh, you know the famous uh, experience, self-experiment of uh, Albert uh, Hoffman and the bicycle ride and all that. And uh, they were asking us if we uh, would like to experiment with that substance and let them know if there was any legitimate use for it in uh, psychiatry and uh, uh, psychology. And uh, my preceptor... Um, uh, Docent Robicek, who was, was very interested in LSD, but he didn't have time to sit, uh, you know, for six or eight hours with his uh, um, patients, uh, with the, the experimental subjects. So he was using uh, several of us as uh, kind of gophers. We were sitting <laughs> in these sessions and we were keeping the records. So I actually started uh, my exposure to LSD uh, already in 1954. But uh, unlike at Harvard, uh, students were excluded, so I couldn't have my own session until I graduated from the medical school. And by that time, you know, my appetite was whetted, so I was sitting in these sessions of uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, artists, uh, and uh, you know, hearing all these fantastic stories about the experiences that they had, but I had no, really, no access to it uh, what application were you looking at initially? Uh, what was uh, what was the the structure? You know, of the initially it was just uh, just a kind of a it was just a phenomenological uh, research, just giving it to different people and seeing what it does. You know, I don't know if you can imagine now when there are a lot of publications and uh, you know other kinds of publicity, what it was like for us when this substance fell into our laps. We had absolutely no idea what it would do. Uh, you know, from session to session. I mean, uh, we didn't know where it would be going. You know, uh, with our patients and, and and in our own sessions. So it was, it was quite an exciting adventure. Uh, I spent s- several years actually doing two sessions a day. I would get up early, wow. <laughs> do a session, and uh, <laughs> at uh, uh, two, o- uh, 2 o'clock, you know, I started another one. And I had a, a department where I had 18 beds, and uh, all the p- patients were getting LSD, so they were really uh, familiar with the states, and all our nurses had training sessions. So by 2 o'clock, I could pass the the person who was coming down from an LSD session to this t- team of uh, nurses and, and patients, and I could start another one. And uh, I was sitting in all of those sessions, you know, all, the whole time, unlike some other places where, for example, Hans Karl Leuner, he was actually leaving the, the experimental subjects uh, alone, and they just had a bell where they could uh, call <laughs> the nurse when they were in trouble. But I was so excited about what was coming on. I, I realized this was, uh, this is going to change, uh, you know, uh, psychiatry, psychology. What what was it about those early experiences that led you to that conclusion that it would change psychiatry and psychology? And maybe just before we get to that, and and I want to talk about your first experience as well. But how many total sessions have you directly or indirectly been a part of or supervised? Uh, with, uh, in your life, at, would you at, say? At this point, would be like uh, uh, four and a half thousand of, uh, you know, uh, LSD sessions. But uh, I had also, I was working with psilocybin also. We, we were working uh, for a while with the tryptamine derivatives, which actually came from Budapest, from our neighbor, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Zara, Stephen Zara and Dr. Bersaramen. They were the ones who actually developed the whole group of uh, the uh, tryptamine derivatives, DMT, DET, DPT. Mm-hmm. Um, they, it, I don't think they had at the time the methoxy DMT, which seems to be the, the most uh, most interesting one. It, it, and the the initial feeling that you that you had, or the the initial uh, I suppose excitement that you felt that this could change psychology and psychiatry. Why was that? What did you see that made you come to that conclusion? Well, the initial was this uh, uh, you know approach, which could be uh, called search for toxin X. Um, the way um, 
LSD came to us was that is a substance that can mimic somehow psychosis. We call the initial sessions experimental psychosis, you know, it was called hallucinogens, psychotomimetic. And so the excitement was that we have a model of something like schizophrenia or the, or the uh, other kinds of uh, psychosis. And this made a possibility of creating a model, which is always great to have a model in, in science. So uh, give uh, LSD, you know, to uh, quote unquote normal subjects, and uh, they would spend six to eight hours in a world that seemed to be like the world of, uh, of our uh, patients. And so the initial, my initial research actually was laboratory. I wrote one of the early papers on uh, uh, the role of uh, serotonin in, in uh, psychiatry. And uh, the initial research was we had a group of 40 people, including ourselves, mostly professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, biologists, and so on. And we had a protocol. We would invite uh, these people for a day uh, to uh, the research institute. We would uh, do really scientific work, you know, <laughs> uh, drawing uh, blood uh, every hour on the hour, collecting samples of urine, doing psychological tests and uh, and electrophysiological uh, investigations. And then we had one day when we brought uh, schizophrenic patients who were matched uh, by age, by, by gender, by uh, IQ and so on uh, with our experimental subjects. And we were looking if these uh, values of these psychological and uh, physiological biochemical tests would sort of converge with the values in schizophrenics. And then something amazing happened. Uh, I found that there was incredible, I would say, inter-individual, intra-individual variability. So you give the same substance uh, uh, in the same dosage under the you know, same circumstances, under the same lousy set and setting, which we had. <laughs> and each of those uh, people would have different uh, experiences to the point that some of them called it like, uh, the, the moments that they get between the tests, it was like a self-analysis, like a, a you know, drug-assisted uh, psychotherapy. Uh, others uh, were just uh, unpleasant physical symptoms. Uh, some of them uh, uh, had you know, paranoid episodes or, or became hypomanic. And for some of them, uh, it was that they, even under those circumstances, they got glimpses of ecstatic states that, uh, that were very mystical. And the same uh, intra-individual variability, if uh, we took the same uh, substance at different times, uh, this phenomenology was completely different. And at that point, I realized this was not psychopharmacology. We were not doing pharmacology because if you do pharmacology, you have to have some idea what you are getting. You know, if you give people apomorphine, you, you expect that a lot of them will be uh, vomiting. If you give them uh, 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 hypnotic, you expect them to, to, to sleep. Whereas here we had no idea what would happen. So I realized we were doing something much more interesting. We, were, we had a catalyst that was, uh, make, made it possible to explore the depths of the human psyche. I realized that people were not having LSD experiences. They were having experiences of themselves. But they were coming from depths that uh, you know, psychoanalysis didn't know anything about. And so at that point, I just lost completely interest in the, this laboratory approach, and I took it to, uh, to clinical work. Uh, and I started giving to uh, my patients, you know, in a psychotherapeutic context. When did you have your first personal experience? And, it was, and, uh, how much, uh, and, how, and what did you take and how much did you take, if you recall? Uh, this was... Uh, Actually, 100, uh, 100 uh, micrograms. It was on the 13th of, uh, of uh, uh, November, uh, 1956. So I was from 54, 56, I was sitting for people. Uh, but uh, it was a little more complicated because my preceptor, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, he was very interested in uh, electroencephalography. And um, at the time when... Uh, LSD came, he was the one who received it from Sandoz. So at the time when it came, he was interested in something that's called driving the brain waves or and, and training the brain waves. This is which using the EEG? 
uh, well, it was exposing people to a very powerful stroboscopic light oh, that's of different right. that's frequencies right. mm-hmm. and finding out if the brain waves in the suboccipital area, which is the, the visual uh, cortex, if the brain waves would pick up that frequency, if you can drive the or train the, the brain wave. So uh, the condition for, for us having the session with him, we had to agree that we would have uh, EEG, you know, before, during, and after, and that we also will have our uh, brain waves driven uh, in, in all those sessions. So what happened that, uh, you know, between the third and the fourth hour when the session uh, usually culminated, uh, the uh, Dr. Robicek's assistant came, and she said, it's time to drive the brain waves. So she took me to a little um, room. Uh, I laid down. She pasted all these uh, electrodes on my head and then brought this gigantic strobe, put it above my head, and then turned this thing on. And in the next moment, there was light like I had never seen. I couldn't even imagine existed. <laughs> my only concept there was uh, this is what it must have been like in Hiroshima where the thing went off you know uh, today I think it was more like uh, Dharmakaya the, the primary clear light from Bardo Tudo from the Tibetan Book of the Dead that we see at the moment of our death uh, but what happened is my consciousness was catapulted out of my body uh, I lost uh, the research assistant, you know, I lost uh, the clinic, I lost Prague, I lost the planet. And uh, I had uh, the feeling that I actually still extinguished uh, in, in the form that I knew myself, but also the sense that I somehow became uh, everything there was. I became all of, uh, all of existence. Uh, and as you know, we must have heard it quite a few times that these states are considered ineffable. It's, uh, when you start uh, trying to, to describe them, it's, you find out that we just simply don't have, uh, don't have language. Our language is developed you know, to communicate about things from, from everyday life. And in my later experiments, some of the sophisticated uh, patients actually tried uh, to use uh, language from cultures that knew something about consciousness, like using, you know, from from Hinduism, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism, uh, from Taoism. So they were talking about, uh, uh, you know, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Samikalpa Samadhi, Kensho, uh, Satori, you know, using terms like Maya and so on. Uh, because we simply don't have, uh, you know, technical terms for, for these states. So uh, these experiences of mystical states are full of paradoxes. Paradoxicality is one of the characteristics. So you can uh, have the feeling that you became nothing, but by becoming nothing, you actually became uh, of uh, existence. Uh, so I was in this incredible state, and then... Uh, as she was continuing uh, working with me, it was unfolding. She had a protocol. So she started from uh, two hertz, which is, you know, two frequencies uh, per second, took it up to 60. And then she kept it for a while in the alpha range and the theta range, the delta range. And then she turned it off. And while she was doing this, at, at a certain point, I actually went from this sense of being everything, uh, of being uh, in the universe, in the astronomical universe, or, or actually being the universe, uh, there were things happening for which at the time I didn't have uh, names. But then later I read about, uh, you know, the uh, Big Bang and the black holes and the wormholes. <laughs> and uh, so this was something in that category that was happening to me. I actually had the feeling again that I not was not only in the universe, but that I, I actually was the universe. And then, uh, you know, as uh, she turned it off, uh, then my world started shrinking again. I found the planet, I found Prague, I zoomed in on my body. Uh, but there was a major problem because my, my consciousness was actually uh, kind of uh, uh, circling around my body and I had difficulties aligning my consciousness with uh, my body. So at that point, it became clear to me that what uh, uh, they were teaching at uh, universities about consciousness as a product of the brain simply was nonsense. That, uh, you know, 
consciousness or something uh, cosmic and that the brain somehow is a moderator for that, but it's not generated in, in our skull. C- could you and then finally, I oh, managed sorry, to ahead. align that mm-hmm. and uh, I came down in a very ecstatic state, very impressed what just happened. And uh, right there, I decided if I'm a psychiatrist, uh, you know, this is by far the most interesting thing I can do working with these, with these states. It just overshadowed psychoanalysis, like, uh, you know, uh, I was not interested in psychoanalysis anymore. I was interested in exploring the psyche using these states. So so you've at this point dedicated more than six decades to studying non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, which is, I think we'll probably talk about this, that is a, a term or a phrase you prefer over altered states of consciousness. But uh, you're, you're alluding to perhaps a definition of consciousness or how you think about it now. How, how do you think about consciousness at this point? You said that uh, it's, uh, I think, mediated or moderated by the brain, but not generated by it. Uh, based on these experiences, the experiences of others you've supervised, uh, everything you've, you've seen and experienced uh, and studied up to this point. How do you think about consciousness now? Are there any other aspects of it that you'd like to yeah, describe? Well, you know, I'm, I'm very close now to uh, Erwin Laszlo, who is this brilliant uh, uh, systems uh, theorist and, and uh, philosopher of Hungarian origin, but living in Pisa in, in Italy. And he has a series of books where he is really addressing these problems. He's the only one that, that I think found some way of scientifically uh, describing what is happening to us. And he has uh, a book called uh, What is Reality, where he actually goes through these uh, different experiments that we have related to consciousness and uh, uh, argues, you know, what what are the um, uh, observations that we have against the idea that, uh, that consciousness is local, that is inside of our brain. And he moves to the, that consciousness is more transpersonal, that it, uh, in non-ordinary states you can have experiences of consciousness of other people, you can have experiences of, uh, of being, um, becoming uh, members of a different species, you know, and not just animals but also plants and so on. So he moves from that, from the consciousness being local to consciousness being transpersonal, and then he brings even arguments against that and concludes that that consciousness is cosmic. And, you know, that would be, that would be my present understanding. The consciousness is simply a, a part of, integral part of existence. It cannot be reduced to, to anything as let alone the neurons in the, in the brain. Uh, so this also supported now, of course, by many people from quantum relativistic physics, and, uh, for example, Stuart Hameroff initially thought that maybe it's the uh, so-called tubules in the mitochondria in the, in the brain that might be the place where some quantum processes generate consciousness. And then uh, later he sort of took it back and he says now, uh, according to him, consciousness is simply a, a property of the universe that can be traced back to uh, the Big Bang in the form of proto-consciousness. Okay. There's, there's a term that people often associate, of course, rightly with you in association with consciousness, and that is holotropic states of consciousness. And I'd love to to jump into that because, uh, and also just as a side note for people listening who are wondering what the applications of uh, these these uh, non ordinary states might be or how they've been utilized. There are many, it it appears to me that there are many, many different ways to utilize this. There's certain multiple Nobel prizes associated with it. Carrie Mollis, Francis Crick, and the co-discovery of the double helix. And then there are, uh, you know, well-known entrepreneurs and so on like Steve jobs. But what does holotropic refer to a holotropic state of consciousness? Thank you. It's a great, great question. Well, I have so far been, or we have been using the term non-ordinary states of consciousness which is better than one, what psychiatrists, British and American psychiatrists are doing, calling it altered state. You know, I really dislike uh, that term, although it was coined by a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Charlie Tart. 
because it suggests somehow that there is a correct way of experiencing ourselves and the world, and that somehow uh, disturbed. You know, I always have to think about veterinary medicine. We talk, we had our dog altered. Uh, so I feel too much respect for these days to call them altered. And even the state non-ordinary is really not uh, accurate because there are many non-ordinary states that uh, have not the properties that uh, the holotropic states would, would have. So I use the term uh, holotropic for a special large subcategory of non-ordinary states that have healing potential, therapeutic potential, that have, according to my experience, transformative potential, that have uh, what we call heuristic H-E-U-R, which means when you work with these states, you run into a lot of paradigm-breaking uh, observations that challenge the whole way of thinking, not just in psychiatry, but in materialistic science. And then I believe they also have evolutionary. In other words, they would, I think they would, if people would systematically use them, uh, I, I think we would almost become another, another species. You know, people uh, work through a lot of aggression. It's replaced by compassion. They have the experience of uh, tremendous uh, ecological sensitivity. They, they discover that we are deeply embedded in nature and that we cannot do anything to nature that uh, doesn't uh, damage us. Uh, they start seeing uh, violence as an unacceptable way of uh, of solving uh, problems. You know, they have a sense of uh, uh, being actually uh, global citizens uh, rather than being uh, Czechs or Russians or Americans. They start seeing themselves very much uh, the way it happened to the astronauts who had the possibility of actually seeing the the planet uh, from uh, from uh, the moon or from space uh, so um, this is my term f that i coined because i realized that psychiatry does not have uh, that kind of distinction so i coined it myself it's a <clears throat> kind of a verbal hybrid it's a neologism as we call it uh, that comes from uh, the Greek language, where holos means whole, and trepo, trepain, means uh, moving in the direction of something. I usually refer to the, the word uh, heliotropism. Helios means sun, and heliotropism is uh, the property of plants to always orient themselves towards the sun, always follow the, the sun. So uh, literally this means moving toward wholeness. You know, when I when I use that term, there's usually somebody who say, uh, what do you mean moving toward wholeness? Aren't we whole already the way we function in everyday life? And I would have to say no on the basis of my experiences. We have, uh, we're using only a small fraction of our experiential potential when we are in the ordinary states. So maybe I just give a few examples of, of holotropic states so people have a sense what I'm talking about. Yes, please. So one category when you would uh, find states that I call holotropic would be the initiatory crisis of shamans. You know, the career of most shamans begin by a spontaneous experience of uh, traveling into the visionary experience of traveling into the universe, being uh, uh, traveling into the, the um, underworld first. Uh, uh, they have the experience of being exposed to some uh, uh, ordeals, uh, the experience of uh, a lot of emotional, physical pain, and they experience annihilation, and then uh, experience of psycho-spiritual death rebirth that's followed by this journey into the supernal realms. And in this uh, initiatory journey, they heal themselves, typically. Uh, anthropologists call shamans the wounded healers, and they also learn how to heal. So when they then uh, manage to come back and they ground the session, they use holotropic states in uh, their healing. When they heal, they either go into a non-ordinary state or they induce them in their clients or both shamans and clients get into this holotropic state. So that's a major category. Uh, the second one is what you see in uh, so-called uh, rites of passage. This is the term that was coined by a Dutch anthropologist, Arnold van Hennep. That's G-E-N-N-E-P, who studied many native cultures, and he found out that they all, uh, uh, you know, at the time of important biological or social transitions, uh, perform uh, very powerful rituals, uh, 
when they also induce in these holotropic states in, in different ways. Uh, many of those cultures, uh, even with psychedelic plants or psychedelic psychedelic uh, materials, in some others using, uh, uh, you know, uh, sonic uh, technology, drumming, uh, rat rattling, and so on, uh, physical pain, uh, stay in the desert, stay in the high mountains, uh, stay in a, a cave in the Arctic ice, and so on. And if you study these, the people experience uh, psychospiritual death rebirth, very much like the shamans in their spontaneous uh, initiatory journey. Now, the third important category uh, were the ancient mysteries of uh, death rebirth, uh, like the Eleusinian mysteries or the Isis Osiris mysteries in Egypt or the Sumerian uh, mysteries of Inanna and uh, Dumuzi. And also, you know, they were, they were Mesoamerican uh, mysteries of Shibalba, the Mayan, and so on. Uh, so uh, all these were inducing uh, these holotropic states for healing and uh, transformation. And then also all the major religions developed what I call technologies of the sacred, you know, different forms of yoga, uh, different schools of uh, Buddhism from uh, uh, Theravada to, to Zen and uh, Vajrayana, Taoist exercises uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, Hesychasm, the Jesus uh, prayer, or the exercises of Ignatius, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, uh, the various Kabbalistic, uh, Kabbalistic exercises. So those were all um, um, methods uh, that were uh, designed to, to take people into these holotropic experiences, uh, for the purpose of, of having a mystical experience, having a spiritual experience. And of course, we have now modern uh, technologies of the sacred to induce holotropic experiences. We have now uh, pure alkaloids from, from uh, the psychedelic plants. You know, we have uh, mescaline from peyote. We have uh, psilocin and psilocybin from the magic mushrooms of the, uh, the Mazatex. We have now... Um, uh, the uh, ibogaine from from eboga from from the African uh, um, African uh, bush and so on, and we also have now uh, the tryptamine derivatives, uh, uh, DMT, uh, DPT, and then methoxy DMT. Those are uh, active in ayahuasca and in the different snuffs from the Caribbean. Uh, and also from this uh, uh, toad that's now becoming very famous, the Bufo, Bufo alvarius. These are secretions from the parotid glands and from the skin of these toads. Very, very powerful, very important uh, psychedelics. So let, let me pause for one second. I have many, I'm not going to lose track of the train, and I have uh, a, a number of different questions. But since since you brought it up, uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, different mutual friend, had, had suggested I ask you about Toad. And you just mentioned that uh, it, it could be or is important. And you mentioned methoxy DMT, uh, which, you know, in this case, uh, often referred to in 5-MeO DMT. W what are your thoughts on this particular, this particular compound? Uh, and, and why is it important, if it's important? Well, it, the thing is, it has not really been explored scientifically, unlike uh, psilocybin or, or uh, LSD. But we have enormous amount of information from uh, either semi-legal or illegal, you know, underground uh, experiments, which were happening during those years when psychedelics uh, uh, were not really uh, explored scientifically. Uh, but we have a, an amazing book by uh, Ralph Metzner, which is called The Toad and the Jaguar, uh, Ralph traveled all over Europe and in the United States visiting these groups that were using it, um, you know, either using some legal uh, loopholes or, or uh, you know, doing a kind of an underground uh, research. And he wrote this uh, book where he, where he collected that information in a, in a way that uh, could become a basis of, of scientific research. Now, what is fantastic there is uh, that this substance creates a very short, uh, uh, you know, within an hour, 
which is within the time of one psych psychoanalytic session, you can uh, experience significant uh, transformation, even even spiritual uh, opening. Uh, and the the substance is methoxy uh, DMT. I have in my book uh, when the impossible happens a chapter. Uh, which is called the, uh, the Secret of the Toad of Light. There are churches in the American uh, Southwest that are actually using it as a sacrament. It's called the you know, Church of the Toad of uh, Light. And I took a fairly large dose, which is not uh, just more than is usually used. Uh, this was my first time when we really didn't know, I didn't know the dosing. And it was estimated 25 milligrams. Today you would use like five or ten, and uh, this was uh, my, my by far the most powerful psychedelic experience I've ever had. And uh, within seconds, you know, it took me uh, out of my body. There were no, there's nothing biographical, no, no birth experiences, no, nothing archetypal. I was just facing this uh, incredible. Um, I mean, source of light you know, for the for the lack of a better description. It was like beyond anything I could imagine in terms of the the brilliance, the incandescence that it had, but also sense that this there was in, incredible intelligence, creative intelligence was going beyond any uh, dichotomy. So I couldn't say if it was demonic or or divine. Uh, you know, there was just off the scales that I had. Um, and then coming down uh, from that experience, I actually uh, had the feeling I was dying, but the feeling that I was uh, <laughs> not from life into dying, but from a place beyond uh, death into a dying body. And then after a while, it became clear that uh, this was not really dying. It was just the experience of dying. And for quite a while, I was in a situation where uh, I was in a, an absolutely blissful kind of state, and I was having visions of uh, streams of my past life experiences where I had feeling of, you know, dying and being uh, killed in different situations. Um, my body was kind of acting out the, the agony, it was, it was shaking, twitching, uh, by, you know, psychologically, emotionally, I was in, in absolute bliss. And then uh, coming down for a week, I was in a state in which I would like to live. Uh, we were at the time uh, uh, living at Esalen. We had a deck overlooking the ocean. And this was the time when I was handwriting my, my manuscripts and giving it to a secretary and then having to edit it. And I was in that week, I was doing editing of my manuscript, which I could do perfectly, lying in the sun there. And then I felt I would take a little break. I, again, within seconds, I had the feeling of just uh, oneness with uh, the, the whole environment, oneness with the world. And then I would open my eyes and I could continue editing. But then, of course, uh, you know, the uh, uh, sort of the uh, consciousness of the industrial civilization came back, you know, had to uh, do workshops, travel, uh, you know. Uh, so um, I didn't stay in that in that state, but uh, uh, my meditations became you know, much, much, uh, much deeper, and it was not difficult to get into some version of that state, you know, just through meditation. So I think this would be an amazing, uh, amazing substance to try for practical reasons, because you you will not find a psychiatrist like myself uh, in the, um, you know, in the 60s and so on. Uh, sitting for six hours with uh, their patients, but they could certainly uh, do a one-hour um, session with the methoxy DMT. And uh, I think significant uh, therapy could be done, you know, within these very short, uh, short terms. It's also, according to Ralph Metzner's observations, uh, it's a, a substance where the experience ends very cleanly. There is no sort of lingering on. So there is a very powerful experience, but also a good, uh, good uh, closure. So anyway, so this is my experience with uh, methoxy DMT. Now, of course, uh, it's very, very popular. For example, we had the uh, transpersonal conference in uh, Prague, you know, and there were lectures about it. And of course, there were there were people who had access to the to uh, uh, 
the toad material to the, to the excretions or secretions of the glands. So it's becoming a very, very popular, uh, popular substance right now. Uh, you mentioned therapy a few times in describing your experience with 5-MeO-DMT and the potential, say, within a one-hour window or something like that uh, to uh, provide uh, therapy if someone were sitting for someone experiencing this. Uh, and that, I want to tie that into a comment that you're very famous for having made, and I think it was in your first book in 1975, Realms of the Human Unconscious, uh, where, in which you mentioned that LSD could become for psychiatry what the microscope was for biology and uh, and medicine and what the telescope is for astronomy. Uh, and what I'm curious about is, I, I suppose, A, why you say that, but then B, is there still a place for psychoanalysis, you know, traditional psychoanalysis or psychotherapy in combination with some of these uh, psychedelic compounds? Uh, because it, it's, it seems to me that the uh, perhaps some of the value that people derive from these experiences or don't derive from these experiences is dependent quite a bit on what happens beforehand and what happens afterwards. Uh, but I just, I just love to hear you, I suppose, clarify what you mean by LSD becoming for psychiatry with the microscope is for biology and the telescope is for astronomy. And then B, if therapy still has a place in combination with these experiences. Uh, uh, yeah. Another wonderful question. So let me tell you what happened when I lost interest in this laboratory uh, uh, research and took it to the, the clinic. Uh, uh, we were, you mentioned in the in your interview with uh, Michael Pollan, there are these two forms uh, they've been using uh, uh, LSD and other psychedelics, the psycholytic and the psychedelic. The psychedelic is the, you know, using large dosages, fully internalized with uh, headphones, eye shades, and uh, the method that uh, was used mostly in Europe, but also by some American uh, therapists, is called psycholytic, which is sort of dissolving the psyche, dissolving the tensions, conflicts in the psyche, and so on. Uh, from from there, uh, lysis means dissolution. And so I started it with using sort of medium dosages, maybe you know, 150, uh, maybe up to up to 200 at the beginning. And what happened was absolutely fascinating because uh, I saw intensification of the symptoms that the patients were having, but then the process automatically took us to the different layers of uh, traumatic experiences that were actually underlying that disorder. And uh, layer after layer, uh, then I came up with the concept of uh, COEX system, system of condensed experience, where each symptom had like a uh, uh, history, you know, has a, 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 a series of uh, layered uh, experiences behind it. Uh, and so it was a process of exploring the different layers of the psyche. Uh, one of my patients called it uh, onion peeling of the, of, uh, the psyche. Another one called it uh, chemoarchaeology. <laughs> so you could really uh, explore the different layers of the postnatal biographical level. This is what what uh, Freudian analysis is about. But the problem is, it didn't stop there. Then each of those uh, coex systems also had a contribution from the trauma of birth. So even if we're using these lower dosages, uh, as we were going on, it took us to birth. And that point, suddenly, people started experiencing uh, uh, that they are trapped, they're caught. Uh, they are in a situation of no exit. Uh, they had the feeling they're getting crazy. Uh, you know, they are dying and so on. And, um, you know, my psychiatry and my, uh, my uh, psychoanalytic training did not prepare me for that kind of thing. And it took a while, including my own experiences, to realize there was a powerful record of biological birth in there. So... Um, what we activated actually uh, in the psyche was what I call now self-healing intelligence of the psyche. You see, the the process spontaneously was talking uh, was taking us to the sources of uh, of uh, these uh, emotional and psychosomatic symptoms. It also created automatically a mapping of the psyche. So, um, 
for a while I was uh, just collecting these uh, um, reports from the patient, my, my own records and, and uh, people's uh, uh, um, you know descriptions of their sessions. And I was putting it on a map, creating a what I thought was a new map for uh, for psychology, um, which would be um, and the result of the fact that we had absolutely new tool, like a microscope opened up, you know, this whole underworld which we and, or microworld which we didn't know existed, and telescopes discovered new new galaxies that the astronomers didn't know about. So, uh, you know, I felt we were discovering. Uh, uh, the depths of the uh, of the psyche. So in that sense, it was like a microscope or a telescope. But it also was the self healing intelligence that that sort of uh, uh, emerged uh, out of it. And, and do you find now when I finally got the map together? Yeah. Please. Oh no, I was just going to say. Uh, please continue. I was just going to um, just going to ask about if there are adjunct therapies or things that you would add to the beginning the the pre psychedelic experience or post psychedelic experience but I, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought well just i just a couple of sentences so the, the new map which i created which i thought was new had the biographical level which it shared with psychoanalysis and current uh, psychiatry because uh, you know however much freud was criticized the psychiatry accepted his uh, uh, idea that the newborn is a tabula rasa, is a clean slate. That there's nothing of interest uh, <laughs> for psychologists, psychiatrists that precedes birth. And this was a major discovery. There is a powerful, powerful record of birth. And uh, when you become of, uh, aware of that fact, you have to radically change, transform uh, thinking in, in psychiatry. So this new new map or map that I thought was new, had the biographical level that it shared with uh, with uh, current psychiatry, but then I had to add the level which I call perinatal, which is related to birth, it's the record of birth, and then it opened up further into uh, the level that I call uh, transpersonal now. And uh, there's a great overlap with what Jung described as the collective unconscious, the historical and the the uh, archetypal unconscious. But you see, when I had the map, I realized this was not a new map at all, actually a map that in different forms has been around for not for, for centuries, but for millennia. I started seeing the connection to the great spiritual philosophies of the East, of Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, you know, Sufism, and so on, and even the shamanic Maps. There was a lot of overlapping with the with the shamanic uh, cartography. Uh, so I haven't forgotten your original question about psychoanalysis. Uh, now the problem is that psychoanalysis has this very narrow map, limited to postnatal biography and to the individual unconscious, which is uh, just barely scratching the surface of what the psyche really is. So if you would uh, do psychoanalysis, you would have to expand the conceptual framework very, very radically, because otherwise, if you would get to something like perinatal experiences or, or transpersonal experiences, you would not have any map if you use just Freudian, Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, so it's not the, it's not the question of the, of the technique. I think in my understanding, Freud was actually in the right, on the right track. He was asking questions like, why do we have, uh, um, you know, hysteria? Why do we have uh, uh, phobias? Why do we have uh, obsessive compulsive neurosis? Why do we have perversions and so on? He was tracing it back, but unfortunately his map was very superficial. He did not have access to the, uh, to the perinatal level, to the transpersonal level. So he ended up with conclusions that then... Uh, um, sometimes uh, seemed absurd, uh, you know, like uh, uh, suicide is killing the introjected uh, bad breast of your mother and so on. And then there was a tendency just to move away completely and not ask the questions about etiology. That Freud's genius was trying to understand, you know, why do we have 
certain kinds of symptoms? Why do we have anxiety? Why do we have uh, depression? Why do we have uh, suicidal tendencies and so on? And was looking for uh, rational understanding for this. But he took it only um, not even halfway. Had he had access to the perinatal level, he would have gotten much more uh, uh, convincing understanding. Why do we have... Uh, Depression, different forms of depression. Why? What? What does it mean when people want, uh, want uh, uh, to kill themselves in a way that is non-violent, as compared to people who have the tendency uh, to uh, commit violence, suicide, and so on? So, if you expand the cartography and you you add the perinatal level and the transpersonal level, you can continue this uh, psychoanalytic work actually and get um, you know some reasonable quite convincing answers. Why do we have certain kinds of symptoms? Why do they cluster in what we call syndromes and so on? And it also opens up a new radically different uh, approaches to psychotherapy, which would be would have to be experiential. If the roots of uh, emotional problems are not just uh, postnatal, but also perinatal and transpersonal, you cannot reach it by talking. You would have to actually uh, use experiential uh, psychotherapy of the kind that started in the in the sixties, the developed in, within humanistic uh, humanistic psychology. Well, l- well, let's let's go directly to that, and uh, I, I certainly have. We're going to come back to when the impossible happens. We're going to come back to many different pieces of your past experience and and more recent projects. But this experiential psychotherapy in 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 an ideal world based on all of your experience, what would that look like? What would the format look like? Well, we are talking about uh, psychedelics. So one would be psychedelic-assisted uh, psychotherapy when uh, you know people would have sessions and then you would use talking, uh, uh, helping them to, to integrate, helping them to, to understand. So there would be, you know, focus on the, on, in the therapy would be on the experience, but also... Um, it would be so uh, at the same time very much what it was for Freud. It would be exploration of the psyche, getting to know the dimensions of the psyche, the the different uh, levels of experiences, and, and so on. Uh, but now we have powerful uh, non-drug experiences that can actually take you to those levels, to the perinatal level, to the uh, transpersonal level. So um, my late wife Christina and I developed uh, what we call holotropic uh, breathwork where you use very simple means, which is uh, faster breathing, uh, some powerful evocative uh, music, a certain kind of uh, body work, uh, and then we also use um, art, we use mandala drawing and sharing groups. And people have access to, uh, not just to the postnatal biographical level, but also to the perinatal and to the transpersonal level. Uh, so there are, you know, there are both pharmacological and non-pharmacological ways of, of uh, uh, accessing these levels uh, that have uh, the deepest roots of uh, emotional and psychosomatic problems. So I'm really glad you brought up holotropic breathwork, uh, which is, as you mentioned, a non-pharmacological or non exogenous way of, of inducing these, uh, holotropic states, uh, which, which I've, I've experienced three times in different, uh, workshops for holotropic breathwork. And, uh, I, I, I went into it. I'm not going to lie to you skeptical as someone with psychedelic experience that it could achieve anything comparable. And I was really stunned, uh, by just how, uh, how powerfully you can induce uh, these these non ordinary states mm-hmm. using breath work, uh, and what I observed in other people in the rooms as well, who many of many of which were were skeptical as I was at the time. So two two questions to to uh, dig into both the uh, I suppose psychedelic or entheogen assisted, and then the holotropic breath work approach. What what psychedelic materials? in what dosages would you potentially be using uh, with what frequency? Would it be once a week, twice a week? Would it be determined 
by the patient? Would it be psycholytic dosing or would it be psychedelic dosing? How would you think about that piece of the puzzle? Uh, I wouldn't do psycholytic therapy, although I very much value uh, the information that I got from it, you know, the self-healing intelligence of the psyche, the coex systems and, and just discovery of uh, the, uh, the dimensions uh, that are on that expanded map being taken to, uh, to the perinatal level and then to the transpersonal level. Uh, I also have a lot of interesting uh, observations. Uh, if you read the uh, realms of the human unconscious, uh, this lot of it is about um, trying to understand how and why uh, the world is changing under the influence of LSD or some other psychedelics. Uh, I became fascinated, you know, the people saw me at different periods of their session as uh, different things. They saw me as a jaguar, they saw me as Hitler, they saw me as angel, they saw me as a supreme judge. Uh, or they look around the, uh, the treatment room and sometimes they had the feeling that uh, they are on the death row, sometimes cabin in the Pacific, uh, sometimes, sometimes it was the bordello and so on. So I did uh, the kind of Freudian work on it, trying to understand how it condensed, you know, different levels of the material. Uh, so I got a good understanding of the dynamics of the postnatal uh, biography. But I also uh, found out that it was not the most effective way of getting therapy, therapeutic results. So then uh, already in Prague, I increased the dosages. I started using music and, uh, and the headphones, eye shades. And this is how we did the whole research uh, at Spring Grove, the American research when I, when I came to the United States. There you can very, very powerful transformation, you know, within, within six, eight hours of the high dose. Uh, but you don't have any idea why that happened. You don't understand uh, the mechanism of the change. It resembles uh, the material that John Rosen described when he studied the uh, experiences of people who did suicidal jumps from uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge and, and um, the, Babe, uh, you know, uh, the Bay Bridge. He found that people who survived it, which is about 1%, they usually survived it unscathed, and they experience powerful transformation within the three seconds that it took to get from the fall from the railing to the surface of the water, and then maybe about eight minutes in cold water before they were rescued. Uh, um, again, powerful, powerful changes that you know you wouldn't achieve by years of psychoanalysis, but uh, there was no understanding what what happened. Uh, now, with this history of the psycholytic therapy, I have now some idea about what is hap happening in these high dose sessions, but in a very condensed, very rapid, rapid way. So, by high dose, I would, what does that generally mean? Uh, say it once more. Oh, by high dose, how many micrograms would you generally be, uh, be using? Okay, I would probably use now a dosage is like, uh, you know, 300 uh, or even 400, uh, 400 micrograms, which, uh, you know, might be in some instances, not very frequently, might be a challenge, uh, management of the, of the session, but you generally get much more powerful transformation, also cleaner. Actually, if you use smaller dosages, there is a tendency sometimes to actually activate what happens and people have more of a chance to, to resist it if there are areas that they don't want to go into. So I consider the high dosages, if it's proper management, to be more effective therapeutically. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would use now the smaller dosages if we continue the... Uh, the exploration of the psyche, you know, that's that's where lower dosages are certainly uh, very useful. And I'm very sorry that this is not happening with uh, with psychedelics in this new renaissance, with that we don't continue the Freudian work where we are trying to to go to uh, to find what the roots are, trying to understand the etiology. Now, in this in this uh, later uh, DSM, the, the Diagnostic and Statistic, Statistical Manual. Uh, they moved completely from any question of etiology. You know, they now just uh, describe the uh, the symptoms. They use what they call neo Krepelian uh, approach. Uh, Emil Krepelin was the uh, the person who did the first diagnosis in 
in uh, psychiatry at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. Um, this, uh, dementia precox, which was the original name for schizophrenia and manic depressive disorder. Those were the, the first two diagnoses in psychiatry. And what he did, he just simply described uh, the symptoms that these patients have. And now the tendency in psychiatry is to go to the neocrepelian. Like in the DSM, you don't ask the question, why do we have uh, depression? Why do we have suicidal tendencies? Uh, you know, uh, why do we have different psychosomatic disorders? It's just simply describing the, the symptoms. And I think there is tremendous field of discovery, which would be doing individual cases. Like initially in psychoanalysis, you had, uh, I think, about 1,500 psychoanalysts all over the world who were seeing their patients and they were they were describing what they observed, and it was published in journals and so on, until they ended up with the psychoanalytic understanding of uh, emotional and psychosomatic disorders. You find in Otto Fenichel's book, The uh, Psychoanalytic Theory of uh, Neurosis. Uh, um, so we need, we need to continue that kind of work. This would be something for psychoanalysts to do, you know, to continue Freud's exploration of the psyche, trying to understand the psyche, understand why we have symptoms and syndromes, uh, but not keeping it just on the, uh, on, uh, um, the postnatal level. In the, by etiology, I think that was the word that I heard earlier. Is that the exploration of the why we experience the causes, these things? Yes, the causes. the causes. Why do we have that? You know, so Freud, Freud had the, the concept of the development of the libido, the oral phase when uh, the sensual feelings are associated with nursing and uh, this was the, the passive oral and then the active oral when uh, um, the, the infant starts biting his, the teeth and so on. And then it moved to the uh, anal phase, uh, the time of toilet training, and then refined toilet training, which had to do with urination. That was the urethral uh, stage. And then he talked about the phallic stage, which was the stage where the focus is on the, on the genitals, on the, on the clitoris in girls and the, the penis of the boys, and the, where you have the uh, oedipal uh, complex and, you know, the castration complex and all those things. Uh, which was very, very interesting way of thinking, but it didn't go deep enough. So uh, you, you ended up with very unconvincing uh, interpretations. But uh, I have tried uh, in, in my books to uh, continue and see how you would understand uh, in a much deeper way why do we have these things? Uh, why do we have depression, different types of depression, suicidal tendencies, you know, why do we have symptoms like a headache and, and many, uh, many uh, neurotic patients have problems breathing and so on. Where does that come from? Uh, why do we end up with psychosomatic pains for which there, there is no uh, organic uh, finding? So if you expand the cartography, you can really get a much fuller understanding you know, Freud, at a certain point when he discovered the individual unconscious, he compared the psyche to an iceberg. He said what we thought the psyche was, is just a surface, like the part of the iceberg that's showing above the surface. And psychoanalysis shows you uh, also the submerged uh, part of the iceberg. Now, if you now bring psychedelics, you have to change the, the simile or the metaphor. You would have to say, what classical psychoanalysis discovered is just barely the surface. Uh, it's the part of the iceberg that's showing uh, for psychoanalysts. And there is this enormous uh, part of the psyche that remained hidden even for, for uh, traditional psychoanalysis. So, so let me ask so you this. Joseph, Joseph Campbell, I just, let me just say sure. one sentence which I cannot resist. Joseph Campbell, you know, the wonderful... Uh, mythologist uh, with this incredible Irish humor, he put it differently. He said Freud was fishing while sitting on a whale. <laughs> uh, the the you've you have seen so many things, experienced so many things. Uh, let's just call it roughly four thousand five hundred different sessions. You've thought of all these different modalities. Uh, looking at my very very limited personal experience and what I've observed in other people, I've, I've certainly seen as you have some incredible 
examples of transformation, people who have uh, seemingly resolved uh, chronic depression or uh, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, uh, and and experienced incredible healing that, that seems to have a persistent effect after experiencing uh, these, these deep psychedelic states. I've also observed uh, not a small number of people who collect interesting drug experiences or psychedelic experiences, but don't seem to experience mm-hmm. or resolve mm-hmm. any deeper healing. What do you think separates those, those two groups and how, how can you increase the likelihood of real healing, real deep healing occurring? Well, the, the extremely significant uh, is the concept of set and setting. That means who gives it to whom, uh, under what circumstances, for what purpose, you know, mm-hmm. that makes a big difference. I have seen people who have taken LSD 100 times and they didn't discover that it had something to do with their own psyche. It was like going to the movies. They kept their eyes open and, you know, things were floating around. People were making funny faces, like a curious kind of interesting experience, but they had no idea that the way they perceive the environment is actually a result of the projection from their own unconscious. So the one major difference is do you keep your eyes open and walk around, uh, let alone driving cars, what people have been doing and so on, uh, you know, or doing it in raves where uh, it's an open place where uh, uh, people don't know what they are taking, and uh, the police might, they, they know they do something f- uh, forbidden, police might show up. This is the worst possible uh, set and setting. So you increase tremendously the risk of uh, these uh, experiences, and you reduce, you reduce the potential. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's important. Uh, so if you, come, if you come with an intention, the self-exploration, healing, for me, for my first LSD session, it became a spiritual quest. But every every one of my uh, experiences, uh, I had about maybe you know 140 idos psychedelic sessions over the years. It might seem like a lot, but it's expanded over extended over a period of 60 60 years. So if you look at, at it that much, you know it's not that much. Uh, so. Uh, that is extremely, extremely important. What, what is your intention? Do you, is this serious intention or self-exploration, self-healing? Is it part of your spiritual quest? Or I, are you doing it for, for kicks, you know, because it's sort of a, a, a funny, weird, uh, weird experience. Uh, there's also uh, something that Houston Smith uh, said, which was very interesting. Uh, there was this whole discussion about instant on, or chemical uh, mysticism. When we saw in the early LSD sessions that people had mystical experiences, then this whole question of uh, chemical mysticism came up. What, what is it? What are we watching? And there was one group of people who was uh, were these sort of uh, hardcore uh, uh, materialistic scientists. He says, well, here you have it. What the mystics think are some kind of deep uh, insights into ontology and cosmology. It's nothing else but uh, aberrations of body chemistry. So, so much for uh, mysticism, so much for spirituality. It's all chemistry. And there was another group that was saying, uh, no, what is happening? There is a very special group of uh, chemicals that can induce uh, mystical experiences. Those are sacred substances. Those are sacraments. Those are sacred medicines and so on. So they took basically the position that the shamans of uh, uh, native cultures took who were using the psychedelic plants, like your know, teonana cattle, you know, the flesh of the gods and so on. The, the plants either were deities or they had uh, they mediated access to, to deities. And uh, uh, there was this uh, uh, position also, uh, the third position was... Um, the mystical experiences induced by psychedelics are phenomenologically indistinguishable from those that are described in spiritual literature, but they don't have the same value. To have really valuable mystical experience, it has to be a result of, of prayers, of meditation, or it has to come as a grace. There's no way you can take a pill and, and experience God. So people like Meher Baba and so on, they, you know, very, very negative uh, a guy called Zer in, in, in uh, a British uh, uh, British uh, uh, 
a theologian and so on. Uh, so this was put it sort of in the in uh, the court uh, of uh, spiritual teachers to say are these valuable or not, and there was disagreement. All the Tibetans, for example, that I have known and, and actually been in uh, around some of them when they had uh, uh, sessions, they all valued it very much as something that that is uh, accelerating your spiritual spiritual uh, development. But just caution that this is very this is very powerful that this has to be done very very uh, carefully. Uh, on the other hand, Zen Buddhists uh, usually had difficult experiences with psychedelics because you are not supposed to pay attention to what's happening. Uh, it's called makio. If you just talk, your past life experiences, you're, you're supposed to sit through it and cut into the uh, no mind place. It's very difficult to have 300 micrograms and not to pay attention <laughs> to, to what is You just cut through it, you know, to uh, no mind place. And then this is, uh, and back now to Houston Smith. Houston Smith had a, he who unlike uh, Meher Baba, uh, or Zena, had actually experiences. Uh, he came to us uh, to um, uh, Baltimore, you know, for a session. We had the the possibility of giving sessions uh, legally to uh, people who were uh, ministers uh, doing pastoral count- counseling and so on, uh, I actually was in in uh, one of his uh, one of his sessions. So he knew what he was talking about, and he said the uh, chemically induced uh, mystical experiences are phenomenologically indistinguishable. This was already shown in uh, Panky's uh, um, Good Friday experiment. Uh, in the Marsh Chapel, of the uh, mm-hmm. Boston University, the very the, famous the, experiment, the Good Friday experiment, that uh, you, I know you talked about in your discussion with uh, Michael Pollan. With Michael. And, so on. And, ju- and just to define very quickly, I apologize for people who are listening. Ph- uh, phenomenal, phenomenological, or phenomenology—that's the subjective reporting yeah, the of subjective, experience. If you look at the subjective experiences of uh, people who had them through LSD or psilocybin. Uh, and you compare it with uh, what you what you read about in spiritual literature, but, but, so that's phenomenologically indistinguishable. But he said, but the value would be very different depending on the set and the setting. He said, if uh, let's say you have a situation, there is a party in Berkeley, uh, and the way it was done, and there would be a fruit punch. And a joker comes with a handful of uh, sugar cubes uh, laced with uh, LSD. People think they are drinking punch, and uh, you know this. Uh, they out of their gourds, and there's nobody who's holding the kite string, and so on. Even under these lousy circumstances, sometimes it can happen that people would have mystical experiences, but it would be completely out of context. They would not know what to do. Would have difficulties. Uh, to, to integrate it and become a kind of very likely alien enclave in their in their life. <laughs> if it is somebody who is a spiritual seeker, who reads literature, who is doing systematic meditation, and then now hears that this could accelerate, and he would do uh, the sessions, you know, in a proper set and setting, the context, um, in some kind of a reverential attitude and would do then afterwards after the sessions some some reading and and continue working on it in in meditation this could become a really a powerful catalyst of a spiritual journey and i think that's the, that's the correct answer you know mm-hmm. so you've mentioned uh, seekers and a number of names a, a friend of mine recommended I don't even know this name, and I'm, I'm maybe ashamed that I don't, but I uh, recommended that I ask you about your experiences with Swami Muktananda. And I don't recognize that name, but I, I thought that this is as good a time as any to perhaps bring it up, uh, if, if, you, if you can answer that. Yes, he uh, became kind of quite important figure in, in our lives. Uh, I met him first about 1965 when he uh, was on his second tour around the world. He was the head of the of the Siddha Yoga uh, movement. Um, the, during the first the trip around the world, he was actually accompanied by Ramdas and by um, by Werner Erhard. And uh, again, my my uh, late wife 
Christina, she came to one of his early sessions, he came to Honolulu, and she became a, a devotee of his. And so when we when we connected, she wanted me to meet Muktananda and arrange this uh, this darshan with him in, in Oakland. And um, I described this experience and some later experience again in a couple of chapters in the, uh, the book When the Impossible Happens. And it was uh, very interesting. I was very reluctant, you know, to go. I was not a guru person. I was, was not sort of somebody who would be, you know, uh, at the, the feet of somebody. I had the feeling that ultimately it was between me and the uh, the cosmos and so on. Uh, but uh, we had about 20 minutes uh, waiting for uh, for that darshan. And at that point, she told me that he was a, a Shaivite. Um, she's a, for, you know, a follower of Shiva. And I had some of my most powerful experiences in my sessions with the with the archetype of, of Shiva in sort of various ways. And uh, this sort of changed my feeling about this. It would be interesting to find somebody. I knew that Shaivites are using uh, all kinds of means, including bhang, uh, you know, hashish and so on. And, and uh, uh, also uh, datura. So they have it's a very highly experiential uh, group. And so this changed suddenly my attitude to this uh, to, for this uh, interview, and uh, I walked in, and he he was sitting there, you know, with a, a red ski cap with dark glasses, holding a wand a wand of uh, peacock feathers scented with uh, scental oil, and uh, as I have told lungi, which just looked like a night night shirt, and he sort of. Uh, beckoned me, you know, to come, you sit here, to the chair just by him. And uh, he turned my head and uh, was sort of, took off his, uh, took, uh, or, or sort of shifted up his uh, dark glasses, which he very uh, seldom did. And he sort of looked into my eyes like he was an ophthalmologist, you know. And the first thing that he said is, you're a man who has seen Shiva. He says, this is very good. And this just blew my mind. I just finished, you know, the, uh, describing my experiences with uh, with Shiva and uh, the fact that this was a very important figure. And the first thing that he says is, you know, uh, I can tell you have seen Shiva. And so we had we had this uh, long interview where um, I actually asked him about uh, soma, which I was fascinated by. This is the uh, this uh, psychedelic plan that was used. Uh, you know, in ancient India, and was uh, described in Rigveda. But hundred over hundred stanzas in Rigveda are dedicated to soma. It was a plant, and it was a beverage that was uh, produced. And some of the descriptions show that those were those were powerful psychedelic. You know, half of us is on earth, half of us in heaven. We have taken soma. Uh, so we knew that there was a powerful psychedelic, but the uh, the secret was lost. And so I asked him, and he said, oh, yeah, you know, we, on my birthday, uh, the uh, Vedic priests come down to Ganesh Puri, and they do a Soma ceremony, and uh, you can come as my gift, uh, guests, you know, uh, I will introduce you. And then he, he died before we could actually do it. So uh, to make a long story short, then we were walking out of uh, this uh, his room, and we were standing at the door, and he looked at us and says, uh, you come to uh, our intensives. We have two intens intensives of Kash on Kashmir Shaivism, uh, which is a, a, a kind of a um, um, uh, Mahayana uh, branch of, of uh, Buddhism uh, that uh, started in Kashmir when in the 8th century uh, Rishi had a vision of uh, some rocks near Srinagar and he went there and uh, exposed some uh, uh, cover, uh, vegetable cover, and there were uh, inscriptions carved in the rock that became then the Shiva Sutras. This was like the Bible of, of Kashmir Shaivism. So he said, come, this is on Kashmir Shaivism. He looked at me and says, this will be very important, very interesting for you. And so, of course, we did. And when I listened to uh, the Swami who started describing what uh, Kashmir Shaivism uh, was, 
I had the feeling that he was stealing, uh, you know, sentences and, and paragraphs from uh, uh, an article which I had uh, written, I think, 1969, which was called uh, Psychedelic Ontology and Cosmology Observations from LSD Sessions. So, <laughs> the, the interesting question, what, you know, what is the common denominator between experiences that people have with LSD, this strange substance that Swiss chemists discovered in, in Switzerland, and something that was found written uh, on, the, on the rock in Srinagar in the 8th century. And so then we, we started sort of uh, going to um, uh, these intensives whenever we were, uh, we were near to Muktananda, and then we actually did a large uh, transpersonal conference uh, in uh, in um, Bombay or, or Mumbai. Um, this was 1982, which was on ancient wisdom and modern science, bringing together spiritual teachers and people from the new paradigm circles like Fritjof, Fritjof Capra, and uh, you know others. So uh, uh, that was our that was our history. Well, we've mentioned we've mentioned the title, you know, when the impossible happens a few times. I figure we might as well jump into it and uh, discuss certainly the, perhaps the reasons for writing the book, but also some of the stories. I, I would imagine. Well, I would love to hear some of the stories, and I would imagine people listening would love to hear some of the stories as well. Well, uh, Tim, what happened was that our house in Mill Valley burned down in uh, in two thousand one. And I lost my whole uh, referential library. So it was difficult to write books like I used to, where you have to refer to people's work and, and take passages of it and so on. And so I decided to write a biography. But, you know, my life has been pretty <laughs> pretty intense, pretty rich. So the question was, you know, what do I select? And then I decided to select uh, observations and experiences from my life that... Uh, current materialistic science would consider it to be impossible. This, this is not, not possible uh, if the materialistic paradigm is, is accurate. So I selected them. So it's a selected of, selection of these stories. And uh, about one-third of this is uh, dedicated to amazing synchronicities that I have uh, experienced in my, uh, in my life. And some of the synchronicities were actually related to uh, Muktananda. So there are two chapters of it describing uh, what happened between us and and uh, Muktananda. What is a synchronicity? Well, synchronicity is something that uh, Carl Gustav Jung brought into the to the attention of uh, Western scientists after hesitating for twenty years, uh, collecting for twenty years uh, observations, uh, because he realized this is. Uh, uh, against this is undermining the cornerstone of materialistic science, where uh, the basic principle is linear causality. You know, the, what we experience is a chain of uh, linear causality. Everything that happens has a cause and has an has an effect. And this works in Western materialistic science, with the exception of uh, the the cause of causes. You know, what what uh, caused the beginning of the universe? There we. Uh, we don't go there very frequently because we don't have any any good answers for that. Uh, now, what he showed up that there are situations where uh, there's a meaningful correlation or connection between something that's an intrapsychic event, like a, like a dream or a vision or a psychedelic experience, and something that happens in material universe in the material universe or what we call so-called objective uh, reality, consensus uh, uh, reality. Now, this should not be happening. I mean, our psyche should be reflecting the material universe which is out there. It should not get into a kind of playful interaction with it, okay? Mm -hmm. So let me, let me just give you a couple of um, major examples from, from, from that book. Uh, I am referring to the experience uh, that I had with Joseph Campbell again, you know, great, great... Uh, uh, mythologist, greatest mythologist of the 20th century, probably of uh, of all time, and he used to come uh, regularly to Esalen and do workshop. And he went to our workshop, months long workshops, and so on. And we were doing some workshops with him. And in one of these uh, workshops, he started. He was talking about Jung. He was, you know, great supporter and 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 uh, very enthusiastic about uh, about uh, Jung. And he mentioned synchronicity. 
and somebody didn't understand it and said, Joe, could you explain what synchronicity is? And uh, he first gave this uh, official definition of Jung's, you know, this is a, a meaningful connection across time or space uh, between an intrapsychic event and something that happened in the material world. But he says, I will give you uh, an example. He said, you know, we were living uh, in uh, downtown uh, Manhattan on uh, the 14th floor of a high-rise building, and my office had two sets of windows. One was overlooking 6th Avenue, which was, you know, not, nothing interesting like, like many streets in Manhattan. But the other set was overlooking uh, the Hudson River, and that was a beautiful view. So these two uh, windows were open all the time. The others we were open just for, for cleaning. Nobody was bothered to open those windows. And uh, then he said, and uh, at the time I was working on uh, the first volume of what was supposed to be uh, world mythology, and it's called uh, The Way of the Animal Powers. And that first uh, volume is about shamanic uh, mythologies of the world. And then Joe said, and then I was working on the, the chapter about Kalahari Bushmen. This is a uh, you know, Bushman, you know, living in the uh, Kalahari Desert. And he said that uh, in their mythology, a major uh, heroic figure is praying mantis. And so I, my uh, desk was covered with papers and pictures uh, related to the mantis and the, uh, the Kalahari Bushmen. And there was Lauren uh, Van der Post's uh, book about his childhood when he had a, a Bushman nanny. And he, uh, Lauren uh, Van der Post described how this nanny was seemed to be de communicating with the with the praying mantis that uh, they were having sort of con conversations and uh, you know when the, uh, the with the movements the uh, the praying mantis seemed to be responding to him or to her and then said in the middle of this uh, work I suddenly had this totally irrational impulse to go <clears throat> and open one of the windows that we never open. And I stick, stuck my uh, head out and turned it uh, automatically uh, to the side. And there on the 14th floor of a uh, high-rise building on Manhattan, there was a great specimen of a praying mantis uh, sort of climbing up the, uh, the uh, building and turned uh, her, his head toward uh, Joe. And <laughs> he said... Uh, uh, I took a close look, and uh, the way Le uh, Van der Post described it was true. It, uh, there was something uh, that made the pra praying mantis look like a bushman. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the, that's his story. So you know, it's possible to imagine that somehow praying mantis got into Manhattan. Somebody has it as a pet or whatever, and it, you know, it got to that place. So, but that it in itself is not very uh, probable happening. But the fact that it happened, you know, uh, in such a way that at the time when Joe's head was filled with thoughts about praying mantis and so on, and he had this irrational impulse to go and open the window that he never opened, and he looks out, and, you know, there is a, right there is a praying mantis, and actually turns toward him and gives him a me what, what he felt was meaningful look. That's pretty mind-blowing synchronicity. So, you know, Jung hesitated 20 years before he presented it, 1951, in uh, in one of the Aranos conferences, and it was presented together with a talk by Wolfgang Pauli, one of the founders of, of, of quantum physics, who was uh, first uh, uh, Jung's patient and then a very close, a very close uh, friend. Uh, well, let me just quickly give you another example, which is the most um, mind-blowing uh, <laughs> synchronicity from uh, my life. Yes, please. This happened uh, during our first trip to China, where we were bringing transpersonal psychology and uh, holotropic breathwork to China. And we uh, did a, a workshop, a holotropic breathwork workshop in Jinan, which is the birthplace of, uh, of Confucius. And... Uh, we were having dinner, and one of the participants uh, uh, came to me and said, Stan, I had an experience about you uh, in my dream last night. And uh, um, I said, uh, what was it? And uh, 
she said, uh, it was my great-grandmother who showed up and told me that we have an important stone in our family for generations, and that uh, stone should go to Dr. Groff. So she actually brought it. She was holding a beautiful, beautiful blue uh, velvet uh, bag and opened it, and it was a fossil uh, nautilus. The ammonite, you know, which are the that are the um, ancestors of of uh, uh, the nautilus. Very, very beautiful fossil. Now, the interesting thing was that it was picked up at the top of Mount Everest. I didn't know at that time that it's possible that this is a marine mollusk. You see, so it comes from the bottom of the ocean, and it's some. It got uh, during the creation of Himalayas, got to the top of uh, Mount Everest. Now, what is interesting about this that uh, when uh, I started uh, transpersonal psychology, International Association of Transpersonal Psychology, and the th- series of international conferences, we were thinking what would be the proper logo for uh, the International Transpersonal Association, and we came up with the with the chambered uh, nautilus, you know, which is a beautiful piece of uh, sacred geometry. So for decades, we were using it on the stationery. It was on all the programs of uh, transpersonal psychology. So, uh, you know, here we are bringing transpersonal psychology to China, and a great-grandmother uh, shows up in the dream of a woman who actually was called Meng, which is the Chinese name for dream, and tells her to bring me this uh, this fossil nautilus, you know, which was taken from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the highest mountain in the world, uh, according to the estimates. Uh, uh, the Himalayas were born about uh, about 50 million years ago during the collision of the of the tectonic uh, plates. So this was, a, you know, at least 50 million years old uh, uh, fossil nautilus, you know, symbol of the International Transpersonal Association. <laughs> so, of course, the Chinese press, you know, didn't describe how great the holotropic breathwork was, but they all focused on this incredible synchronicity, you know. <laughs> are, there, are there any uh, other uh, stories or phenomena, experiences that are difficult to explain in that book or outside of when the impossible happens that are related to uh, psychedelic sessions? Well, there are, of course, experiences of the um, uh, out-of-body experiences in near-death experiences, you know, where people who are in a state of uh, uh, clinical death, cardiac death, or even a flat uh, EEG uh, have experiences. They might be watching the the procedure from uh, from the ceiling, uh, uh, so that when they were brought back to consciousness, they are able to describe the the procedure. There is one case where, where this was uh, happening to a woman who had to be frozen because they needed to get to the tumor at the base of the skull, and so she had flat uh, electrocardiogram, flat uh, electroencephalogram, uh, and at the same time, this is the most detailed uh, description of the uh, of the surgical procedure that we have. Where she was able to to draw the uh, instruments uh, that they were using and so on. So there are many, many of these, and uh, we had we had a couple of those experiences with our own uh, cancer patients. So this uh, one of them is described uh, in the book. Uh, uh, there is uh, there is uh, one chapter which I called uh, unorthodox psychiatry, where people experience healing in connection. Uh, with experiences that uh, you know wouldn't make any any sense to current psychiatrists. What what would be an so, example of that? So there was one uh, situation where we had a five day uh, um, workshop at SLN, and a woman came who had for the last two years had had a, a very bad uh, depression, which uh, psychiatrists would consider to be what's called uh, endogenous which, of course, doesn't mean anything. And endogenous means uh, generated from within. Uh, but the characteristic is that it's worse in the morning. So she got out of the bed, and it took her like a couple hours before she managed to brush her teeth and, and uh, you know, uh, get dressed properly and so on. 
So she had uh, um, two sessions uh, with us, which we had in the five days uh, at SLN. And, uh, you know, they were pretty powerful things from childhood, and she was uh, uh, reliving her birth. But uh, Friday in the morning, which was the last day she came, and she uh, uh, actually experienced some intensification of of these um, feelings. So we uh, asked her to lie down. We had a different different, uh, program for that morning, you know, the conclusion of the five days. But it was clear that we had to do something, so she lay down in the in the middle of the room, and uh, we just told her just to go with the experience. It's, she didn't even do uh, more breathing, and she again uh, completed a little something about the um, experience of uh, the birth, biological birth, and then went to, went into this very strange. Uh, uh, series of uh, movements where it was look like sort of a, a praying or worshiping something. You end up in a in a sitting position, and then this monotonous chant, repetitive chant, came uh, in a language that that we did not understand. And this was going for quite a while, and then it ended, and she uh, laid back, and she was just completely blissed out, you know, in a in an ecstatic state. Uh, the group was reacting in a strange way. People were ending up in their lotus positions, um, you know, um, some of them crying for, for uh, unknown reasons. And we had a, a Jewish uh, psychoanalyst from uh, Buenos Aires participating uh, in this uh, uh, particular uh, five-day workshop. And he came to us and he said, this is fantastic. Do you understand what happened? We said no. Uh, he said she was she was uh, chanting in perfect Sephardic language, the, the Ladino, which is the medieval mixture of, of uh, Spanish and, and Hebrew, and it happened to be his hobby. You know, he he knew the Sephardic uh, language, and we say, wow. He says. We asked him, what, what was she singing? He said, well, she was uh, singing, I am suffering and I will always suffer. I am crying and I will always cry. I am praying and I will always pray. Now, this episode finished this two years of the exogenous depression. We saw her then a couple of times at uh, uh, conferences and the depression never came back. back. So the idea of, you know, healing... <laughs> uh, Depression, pretty bad depression by singing a Sephardic prayer. It's it's a pretty unusual sort of a therapeutic uh, uh, mechanism. Is, what do you so make, I, what, what do you make of that? Yeah, what do you? How do you explain have, that you for know, yourself? We we seen a lot of this kind of thing. The, that uh, healing happens, powerful healing happens in the holotropic breathwork through mechanisms that we don't understand. Uh, I saw before, you know, working with people in, who were in psychoanalysis, so on the opposite, that people, uh, after years of psychoanalysis, they got to the point where they can give you lectures, why they have the problems, how is it related to early cannibalism and, and the, you know, the toilet training and Oedipus problems. Only the problems don't change very much. So you are saying you have the option either have a, a very little result with uh, what seems to be intellectual understanding or a result where you have no clue what, what's <laughs> happening. And, and that particular experience with the Sephardic chanting, that was with, uh, that was following breath work, but not using any type of, uh, dosing of any no, type of no, material. No, we were, we were careful not to bring in people, not to bring anything into, uh, the you know the uh, holotropic breathwork sessions uh, because it's a, the uh, structure is completely different the the timing of the breathwork is different it's about three hours and the type of music that we use uh, so it would not be it would not be great uh, set and setting it's not it's not structured for a psychedelic experience. And actually, this would, uh, you know, disturb. We had one situation, actually, where somebody who had a black belt uh, 
took it going into our uh, uh, our workshop at SLN uh, without telling us and ended up, you know, in a pretty aggressive situation. And uh, it just uh, really disturbed the whole the whole session with um, a hard time sort of, um, you know, bringing him, bringing him down. And, <laughs> that sounds terrifying. Uh, so it's it just been a matter of principle, you know. Mm-hmm. Was not-, not only was it illegal, but it, it just does not does not work well in a context that's that's created for holotropic breathwork if if you had to an, answer the question and, and there might not be an answer to this or there might not be an affirmative answer and, and to the, the question that someone posed to me which was they hadn't experienced holotropic breathwork and they asked but they did have a lot of uh, sort of research experiment uh, experience with psychedelics and they asked what psychedelic at what dose is most similar to, to the effects or the experience of holotropic breathwork uh, <laughs> well it would be more uh, something in the category of mdma in that uh the holotropic breathwork can create visions, you know, visual experiences, but it's not that common as uh, it is in in uh, LSD or in mescaline, where you have can have you know really this fantastic fractal displays of, of uh, colorful images and so on, and and the whole session could be could be very uh, very visual. In uh, the breathwork is more like in MDMA where you have something that's uh, almost like on uh, uh, the interface between vision and uh, a vivid thought and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if, uh, if we were to look at another uh, subjective experience that's reported uh, with, with decent regularity with psychedelics, uh, specifically entity encounters. Uh, and this seems to be frequently reported with, say, ayahuasca or smoke. Say, say it once more. Uh, entity encounters, encountering entities that, that one oh, yeah, believes yeah. to be separate yes. from themselves. Seems to be quite common with ayahuasca or smoke DMT, uh, NNDMT specifically. Uh, what is? Have you seen this in breathwork uh, and also... Do you make any int- attempt to interpret what these things mean, or is it really left to the person experiencing it to integrate it or to heal through such uh, a perceived encounter or something that exists independently? Uh, 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 well, this you know this was described, of course, with uh, with uh, uh, peyote, the mescalito, right, mescalito, and yeah. and also very common with ayahuasca and the pachamama. Right, the mother, you know, mother, uh, and so on. The only time I had it was in an ayahuasca session, uh, where there was a sense of. Actually, it's not true. I had it once in uh, in an LSD early LSD session, uh, where there was a presence. There was a um, energetic presence. I didn't see, you know, a figure, uh, but there was also communication, which was. Uh, telepathic which was without words uh this was uh, very strange because uh, this was at a time when uh, we had closed boundaries we we couldn't even uh, initially travel to russia let alone to to the west and there was this kind of entity appearing in my lsd session uh, it was like a genie almost like asking you know uh, what would you like uh, uh uh, your your life to be like and i said i would like to see the world i would like to understand uh psychosis this was the place i was in and i would like to have a job uh, that's not a kind of a nine to five job i would like to have some kind of a freedom and the answer was uh okay but your task is to bring spirituality to eastern europe and to russia I said, now I really did it. You said, now I'm flipping out. I can't, you know, I can't even tra- travel to, to Poland. Uh, uh, and uh, this is pr- promising me I can see the world. Uh, but then, of course, it it happened, you know, then uh, uh, this, uh, developing transpersonal psychology. It became very, very popular um, in in Russia. And then 25 years ago, bringing transpersonal psychology to to Czechoslovakia, actually. So, so that was a fascinating synchronicity again. Uh, and then I had one uh, 
in the ayahuasca session, but also this was a this was a very uh, uh, intense. But but it was guiding my session was was sort of telling me what I should look look at how I should handle it. <laughs> and that's not uh, something that you observe in in breath work very often. No. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. You know, I actually wrote initially. I wrote that I considered psychedelics to be uh, non-specific amplifiers. Yes. When I and uh, it would have to be modified. I actually all psychedelics uh, can take you to the areas which I described in that cartography. You can experience something from from a child's. Uh, sufficiently important emotionally you can relive your birth you can have prenatal experiences even this is a i almost hesitate to say that reliving your uh, conception you know identifying with the on a cellular level with the sperm and the and the ovum uh, you can have past life experiences you can have archetypal experiences you can it can take you to uh, to the collective unconscious and so on so the cartography applies to all of them, but there is a different style in which it's coming. Uh, you know, let's, let's talk about more more visual, less visual, and so on. More emphasis on on physical feelings uh, or on the emotions. In certainly uh, uh, MDMA or some some of the other uh, entheogens, they uh, shift that whole spectrum towards the positive. There are very few people who have bad trips or MDMA. MDMA is very dangerous uh, physiologically, but very, very easy for most people to to handle psychologically, emotionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I d- discovered this uh, uh, this uh, element in ayahuasca that there is very frequently uh, the imagery of the Amazonian jungle or the anaconda snake is coming, uh, the kind of a a rotor rooter, you know, cleansing, uh, uh, jaguars, images of jaguars. So there is some kind of a selectivity f- what from the collective unconscious is actually uh, prevalent in, in those uh, sessions. Do you have any opinion or opinion of or experience with microdosing of different psychedelics? Is that something you've administered to people? Or uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. It's become a topic... Uh, I had had quite quite a few of like the twenty five micrograms, you know, for for hiking or swimming in the ocean or something. That just enhancement of the of the um, perceptual experience of the world. Uh, but I haven't experimented with the with the small. I had lots of very interesting experiences uh, uh, inside of the sessions, and then particularly coming down from the sessions when I was in a kind of a state that would that you might be uh, experiencing on lower dosages mm-hmm. but it was at the end of a high dose session rather than uh, an experience uh, per se what did you experience at the tail end of those sessions uh, what were they yeah what what were what were those experiences at the tail end of those high dose sessions that uh, that were interesting. Well, there were, you know, all kinds of psychological insights. I mean, a lot of the things that I've been writing about, you know, were combinations of what I saw in the patients and then getting insights and understanding. Uh, uh, even in the in the high dose uh, as pa- parts of the sessions, uh, when I hit some difficult places, like for example, uh, existential despair, feeling, you know, there's no meaning in life, absurdity of life, and so on which uh, uh, very frequently happens in uh, during reliving of birth when you get to what I call the second uh, perinatal matrix, which is the stage of birth where the uterus contracts, but there is uh, no opening. The cervix is not open. So you have the feeling of, of a total, um, you know, existential despair, total bummer. There's no, no meaning. Everything's absurd. Uh, we go from nowhere to nowhere, uh, uh, we come to this world naked, crying in pain, uh, and, you know, uh, without any possession. And this is how we're going to end, no matter what you do in your life or with your life. Those are really heavy kind of experiences. Uh, uh, so uh, I had some of those experiences uh, when either there is a suicidal impulse or even suicide, even suicide would not be solution of uh, trying to get out of that state. 
And so when I was hitting some of these places in my own sessions, uh, I would have like a parade of my patients where I would suddenly say, oh, this is where he was or this is where she was. <laughs> when, I was when I was bringing just my training as a psychiatrist and things that I've read, I realized I was sitting there listening to what they were saying. I had no clue what, the, what, what they were talking about. <laughs> and, but I got really full experiential understanding by finding those places in myself. And this is also interesting about this, this large map of the psyche, you know, that each of us has all those things. It's not a question of whether you are a psychiatric patient or not. If you go deep enough, you, you find all those elements within yourself. If you are dealing, you are processing the hours in the birth canal, you find the whole psychopathology there, all the emotional problems, all the psychosomatic symptoms, the choking, the, the nausea, the, the, the headaches, the, the pains, the psychosomatic pains in the body. Uh, you know, people frequently tell me they found Hitler inside, they found Stalin. I mean, uh, you, you discover the shadow aspect. So, so the, the human personality is a little different from what's described by mainstream uh, psychiatry. You, you and your late wife, Christina, coined the term spiritual emergency. Uh, and uh, she founded, I guess, in 1980, the Spiritual Emergence Network, SEN. Now, I'd love for you to explain what that means, but then also, uh, if, you could also if you could touch on the difference between, or differences, if there are any, between spiritual emergencies that are naturally occurring, let's just say, or what people might view as, say, the onset of schizophrenia in the late 20s or something like that, yes. versus, versus those precipitated by psychedelics? Well, that concept came from uh, the work with psychedelics and with the, with the breath work. You know, when you realize that uh, uh, people in these situations would have experiences like of uh, uh, death, rebirth, destruction of the world, recreation, recreation uh, of the world, you know, past life experiences and so on. And uh, I very early uh, discovered that there was, if you have bad trip, there's no way, no good way of, of uh, terminating it. The worst thing that you can do is what's done routinely, which is come with tranquilizers. When you give tranquilizers to people who are in a, on a bad trip, uh, and then keep them on maintenance dosages. This prevents any kind of resolution. If somebody has a bad trip, uh, that means that they are dealing with a difficult aspect of their unconscious. And when it's coming up, it's coming up for healing. For it's not. Uh, it's not just that the, the drug created this horrible, horrible experience. So, uh, so the way you do it, you have to tell people. You know, you are in a. LSD session, this is a time-limited thing, I'm going to be here, and then when something uh, remains unresolved, we do some uh, body work and some emotional work to bring it to a good closure. People can benefit from these uh, bad trips. So I realized very early that when people had difficult experiences, the last thing I would do is to, to combine with uh, tranquilizers, you know. And so I saw many of the situations where people experienced what they would be hospitalized for in the psychedelic session. And if we stayed with it, it actually was a major healing, major uh, transformation. So then the obvious answer was, you know, should we treat it differently just because it happened without breathing or fast breathing or because it happened without uh, psychedelics? No, we just... Uh, you know, apply it to that uh, other category of spontaneously emerging experiences of this kind. Now, what is necessary uh, for having this kind of understanding, you have to have the large map. The psyche is not just the postnatal biography and the Freudian um, individual unconscious. There is the record of uh, these hours of birth, of the of the anxiety, of the of uh, you know the uh, physical discomfort and uh, also the uh, the amazing uh, uh, aggression, the fury that is generated in the fetus who cannot breathe and is uh, is uh, subjected to all those torsions and so on. Uh, so, uh, if you have a if you have a map that includes that. And if you have the map that includes the collective unconscious, which psychiatry has not accepted, the Jungian idea that we have also uh, the collective unconscious as a regular 
kind of germane part of our unconscious, both the historical part of the collective unconscious and the, the archetypal. So having visions of archetypal beings or being taken to archetypal domains like hell or paradise, those are common experiences uh, in, uh, in the breathwork or in psychedelic sessions. So this just gives you an idea. These are states that you can work with the way uh, you would work with people in a, in a psychedelic session. So, so that's a perfect segue. Let's take as a as a hypothetical situation, uh, and uh, an alternate world where the uh, psychologists and psychiatrists have accepted the collective unconscious and and have this larger map. Someone is brought to a hospital by their family because they seem to be having what the family believes to be a psychotic break, whether it's schizophrenic or uh, di however it might be diagnosed currently they're brought to the hospital if a if a practitioner if a doctor or psychologist had uh -huh. this larger map what would the intervention or diagnostic process look like potentially uh, well people people usually ask me when when i say that the concept spiritual emergency uh, if there are any professional psychiatrists psychologists they say uh, can you give me differential diagnosis? You see, this is what we did in somatic medicine. A differential diagnosis, if people have, uh, uh, you know, infection, you want to find out which infection, what is the differential diagnosis? Uh, what is the differential diagnosis between different kinds of diabetes and so on? So they would like something like that for spiritual emergency, which you cannot do because, uh, the, you know, psychosis is not, this is not a... a medical diagnosis we we can't in the exception of the uh, organic uh, uh, psychosis we cannot um, really um, make the diagnosis we don't have any findings in the cerebrospinal liquid we don't have any findings in the blood we don't have any finding in uh, urine where we can you know have a litmus paper put it in the sample of urine since it comes out uh, uh, you know, green, it's uh, schizophrenia. Right. You basically uh, diagnose these different psycho so-called psychotic states by the fact that people have experiences uh, and behaviors that current model cannot, but, but part of those uh, uh, symptoms which are, which are used as being uh, uh, important, uh, you know, diagnostic uh, tools for, for Psychiatry could be, for example, people have the experience of of death, rebirth, the destruction of the world, recreation of the of the world. They have experiences uh, uh, that seem to be past life experiences. Uh, so those are all absolutely normal uh, um, elements in uh, the uh, human unconscious, but other understood really in, uh, if you want, in the Groffy and Jungian uh, way. The, the, the psyche is infinitely larger than, than uh, mainstream psychiatry ever considered. It's more like uh, the description that you find in the great spiritual philosophies of the East, in Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. They have the, they have the real maps of the psyche because they were focusing uh, you know, for centuries on systematic exploration of the psyche in a very similar way in which we do science. You know, people, they were describing certain uh, procedures that you have to follow, certain forms of meditation. They would collect the uh, descriptions of those experiences, uh, dis discuss, uh, write about it, and so on. So it's a, it's a systematic exploration of the human psyche. Mm -hmm. This uh, uh, cultures were not interested in technology, so they are, you know, nowhere close to what we are in terms of the understanding of the material world. But they are way ahead of us in terms of understanding of consciousness and the uh, and the psyche. And it's very, it's, you know, it's very humbling for somebody uh, like myself having a, a, you know, professional training and being through a stage when I thought what the shamans are doing, the sort of primitives in the jungle somewhere, you know, illiterate and so on. We have our scientific approach, which is behaviorism or, or psychoanalysis. Now this, if you, if you have the experience of these tools that the shamans have available, you develop a lot of respect to that. I mean, so, so related to that, uh, but the question is, it's, mm -hmm. it has to be harnessed, you know, and that's mm -hmm. not an easy, easy task in uh, the um, industrial civilization. 
you would have to change first you would have to change the the paradigm which is a difficult thing you right. probably know that the the shift uh, from the geocentric system to the heliocentric system after copernicus uh, you know published this uh, about the revolutions uh, of the planets it took over 100 years and the 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 uh, uh, resistance it was not just the church this was, the resistance was coming also from from the universities where there are all kinds of arguments why the you know why the earth cannot be uh, uh, round and rotate and uh, and uh, you know around the sun and so on this, for you personally how has your experience of your inner world changed over the last, say, 60 years or after you had your first psychedelic experience? So you have that experience and you go on to well, have all these experiences. What What is your inner, your experience of your inner world look like? How has well, that changed? Well, you know, I was an atheist. Uh, um, this goes back to uh, a little scandal in our family. Uh, when my parents got uh, uh, got f- fell in love and wanted to get married. It was in a small check town, and my father's family was had no uh, religious affiliation, and my mother's family was strictly Catholic, and so the church refused to marry them because my father was a pagan by their uh, definition, and this was created a lot of turmoil. It almost seemed like it would not happen until uh, the solution came. Uh, my um, mother's uh, parents made a major donation to the church and then suddenly they re- relaxed their standards and they allowed that and uh, they had a business on uh, Main Street and uh, so when when the wedding happened they could roll out uh, carpets across the street stop the traffic and to take the carpets to the to the altar so the guests could go from the altar all the way to the house and have a banquet there and my parents got so upset by this that they decided not to commit me or my brother to any religion that we should make uh, our own decision when we come of age so we actually had classes of religion but for me it was always a free hour i would go for a walk or read a book or, or if they were sort of playing soccer somewhere i would join them you know being glad that i had this extra time but also i was a very curious creature i was i was also missing this was called, uh, I think, Paradisian morale or something like this. Were the classes, and they were they were being taught something that I was missing. So I was kind of a little ambivalent about it. But then, from this kind of background, I went to medical school at a time when it had a Marxist regime. We were controlled by the Soviet Union, so we really got the pure materialistic doctrine. You can't you can't get uh, you know more materialistic than that. So. Uh, it was my first LSD session that just changed that. And, uh, you know, I was one kind of person in the morning and another person walked out of there uh, in the evening. I was really basically open to the to the mystical world. I saw that, uh, you know, that was a much deeper understanding that, uh, that anything that, uh, that my uh, formal training provided. So... Uh, so this, the paradox, uh, which I was aware of it when I was coming down as a, as a belief, sort of a, not believing, but a mystical, you know, mystical person, I differentiate quite a bit spirituality from religion. I never became religious in any way. I became very spiritual. And uh, I realized the paradox, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the divine sort of comes to me in an experiment in a, in a Marxist uh, country, you know, induced by this uh, substance from a Swiss chemist. <laughs> uh, but I, I knew, I, I felt I was stuck in psychiatry, and I was at that point not very excited about psychiatry. Uh, but I, I felt, coming down from the session, I felt if I am psychiatry, this is by far the most interesting thing I can study. So if you look at my professional career, there's nothing, uh, those uh, years, 60 years, you know, that uh, I have done that would not be in one way or another related to these holotropic states. That became what I said was my my passion, my vocation, my my profession. Is is there any particular synchronicity or experience in any of the holotropic states that you've 
experienced yourself that, that you find the hardest to explain or the most, uh, un- unusual slash remarkable. And does, does, yeah. does anything come to mind? Uh, I don't know. You, I have so many, so many of them. Uh, I think one <laughs> you of don't the wildest. Have to, you don't have to pick one. Yeah, you could you can choose more than one too. One of the wildest one was uh, actually the first session that I had in when I came to Baltimore from Prague. It was a process when it, my uh, request to for the scholarship was first turned down, and then uh, then. Uh, I appealed, and then uh, I had a very powerful psychedelic session with a colleague of mine, a psychiatrist, and uh, this was a major, major death rebirth opening, and what I experienced, like, you know, kind of Atman Brahman uh, experience, uh, and uh, I came back home, and uh, in the mailbox was a positive response, I can, I can go to the United States, so within a very short time, I packed I ended up, you know, with 40 pounds of my luggage. I took all my records with me, 25, 25 pounds, 15 pounds of personal belonging, and I was going to, to Baltimore. And in Baltimore, we had the permission to give uh, sessions to professionals and collecting the information from that. And so I had a session. We, you know, we uh, qualified for that ourselves. And in that session, I suddenly had the feeling... Uh, that uh, I was not bound by space and time, that I somehow could get to other places in the world if I decide to. Uh, and I wanted to te- put it to a test. I said, can I, for example, get to Prague into into the uh, uh, apartment of my parents? And so I imagined, you know, which direction was Prague and how far, and imagine myself sort of flying uh, in that direction, and I was an experience of flight, but I was not getting anywhere. So I felt th- there was a problem there. And I was thinking about it. And then I realized that I was uh, limited by this, by the concept, this, the coordinate, spatial, temporal coordinates that I believe that Prague is in this direction, uh, you know, and a certain kind of distance that I have to overcome and uh, just imagine that I am, I'm in Prague. And what happened the next time I was suddenly trapped in some kind of very strange space where there were like uh, uh, circuits on, uh, or transistors and stuff. Uh, uh, and I didn't know what was happening. And then I realized I was inside of the television of uh, the, uh, the, the, the you know, television set of my, of my parents. And I was thinking about it and I had to laugh because I was still holding on to... Uh, the next element of the materialistic world. The, the only way you can really see what's happening in other places, you, you need a television, you need, you need a camera and a satellite, you see. So I realized I, I'm not even bound by that. I'm, I'm in, a, in a, uh, the world of spirit. I can just have to say, now I am there and I am there. And then in that, at that point, it turned kind of inside out and I was walking I, I felt straight. I, I didn't feel. I didn't feel I was in a session, and I was walking in that apartment. I, I heard my parents uh, breathing, and I went to the to uh, the window, and uh, there, there on the corner was a clock, and it was showing the, the six-hour difference, uh, which I, I thought for, for a while, and I said, "Not, not a proof, you know." Um, uh, I, I knew it that there was a difference. That my mind could fabricate that. So how do I prove that this really happened? And I said I would go and take a picture of the wall, and then check with my parents. And they would say something strange happened. You know, if we found this uh, painting on the, uh, you know, on the floor, and uh, this nail was still in the wall. And so I started walking to the and reaching for that. And then suddenly I had the feeling that I was gambling. I was, I was playing uh, like a roulette with my, with my uh, soul. That was, this was very dangerous, the feeling that uh, I was getting sort of uh, under the influence of some evil forces. And then I realized how much they warn you if you are on the spiritual quest uh, from that, uh, that period where you start playing with this mind over, you know, the CDs and so on. And uh, I started seeing uh, 
I started seeing images. What what I could do if I really have that possibility, uh, I could go and uh, eavesdrop and uh, political uh, meetings in the world. You know, uh, I could get access to scientific secrets and so on. I could go to a casino. I could beat the casino and so on. And uh, I realized there was a there was a real danger from the ego to to start playing with the the possibility of having this power. So I finally sort of didn't have the courage to do that and also didn't want to be in a world where uh, this would be possible because if I had the power, then other people had the power and then uh, the, the doors don't protect me. I'm in a world sort of, uh, you know, this kind of a wild Western and I didn't, didn't want that proof that this, is, this was really possible. And I went, I lied down on a couch uh, where actually... Uh, uh, I was coming down from a session before going to to Baltimore, and I was lying then. And then this horrible thought came to me: uh, maybe I never got to Baltimore. I am just I fabricated that trip to to the United States in my LSD session. I'm now coming down uh, from from that session. I never left. You see. So I was like the chunk so in that situation, you know, am I a butterfly having the dream of being a human or a human having the, um, the feeling that I'm butterfly? Uh, so uh, I was stuck in that place for a while where I was not sure whether I was uh, having astral projection from Baltimore or whether I was uh, I was coming down from that session. So that was the wildest one probably. And of course, then coming back, I was cursing myself. You know, what a wasted uh, opportunity for a great uh, experiment, you know, the proof uh, as the projection. Uh, and, uh, but the fear and the metaphysical fear that I was really sort of, uh, you know, losing my soul in, in that if I start playing with these kinds of forces. That that uh, last part of that experience in particular sounds terrible. The, uh, the laying down, or terrifying, I should say, laying down on the on the couch in Prague and wondering, like you said, if the entire trip to the United States had been a fabrication. When you came out of that experience, how quickly did it take or how long did it take for you to realize that, in fact, you were back in the United States? Oh, at- like, you know, that probably w- within eight hours or so, I was, mm-hmm. uh, it was absolutely clear, you know. Re- back to calibration. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. If if you were starting your career, just just a few more questions. I, I I've, you've been so generous with your time, but if you were starting again right now, and uh, you were a promising young scientist, you could research anything you wanted. Let's assume that all of these compounds are legal. Uh, what would you focus on? What type of studies would you want to do, or what type of research would you want to do? Well, you know, what, one of the problems with this uh, Renaissance that a lot of it is, is hap- repeating things uh, which were already done, like the cancer projects are great, but but uh, we did it to the point when that when we ask for more uh, money for continuing the research, they say, you have already proved it, now it has to go <laughs> to the hospitals, now it has to be used. And uh, so, uh, you know, those uh, also this wonderful study at Johns Hopkins is just a more sophisticated and methodologically better, uh, you know, Walter Pankey uh, experiment, which had some flaws, certainly. Uh, but I would love to see this now going to the uh, research of creativity to bring people, uh, you know, biologists, quantum relativistic physicists, and see what they can do. Uh, as you know, we have indications that the whole development of computers was closely uh, connected with uh, use of psychedelics, you know, people like uh, Doug Engelbart and, uh, and uh, uh, even, you know, Steve Jobs and all these people made it absolutely clear. Uh, there was a statement that uh, uh, all the people to one, to men and a woman who developed virtual reality were acid heads. <laughs> so, and this is now you know, understood there is a there is a possibility of sort of loosening somehow the the blocks that we have in problem solving because we are stuck with a paradigm. You know, Thomas Kuhn wrote that fantastic book, The Structure of uh, of uh, Scientific Revolutions, showing that the history of science is not a linear development where we started from not knowing anything and then each generation added a little 
of the observations and there were you know more and more accurate uh, hypotheses and theories created so that what we have now the understanding of the universe is the is the best understanding that has ever been in you know in any at any time in any society and it showed that it's it's a joke that the development of science breaks into these uh, distinct periods and each of them is governed by what he calls a paradigm you know a way of uh, Looking, looking at the world, you know, certain basic metaphysical assumptions, uh, uh, beliefs, uh, ways of uh, what are relevant uh, uh, areas to research, uh, how do you do research, how you evaluate it. This is all paradigm uh, tied. So the examples, of course, I already mentioned the, the shift from uh, the geocentric to the heliocentric system. There was a one uh, revolution in chemistry where they had phlogiston chemistry, where there was this royal substance of uh, phlogiston. And then when people like uh, like uh, Dalton or Lavoisier came with the idea of atoms, you know, uh, uh, people had problems because they didn't believe in, uh, in phlogiston anymore. Now we laugh when you hear that. And then, of course, the the first three decades in the 20th century, the physicists had to go through this incredible uh, conceptual cataclysm, moving from Newton first to the, the theories of relativity and then to quantum physics, that even Einstein, who initiated or couldn't accept at, until his death. So this is, this is the question of paradigm. So I believe that we are now in the period of paradigm shift uh, in relation to consciousness and the human psyche that's comparable in nature and scope to what the physicists had to uh, experience in the first three decades of the 20th century. And then, in a sense, it can be seen as being complementary to the changes that already happened in uh, the understanding of matter. You know, the quantum physicists... Uh, uh, who are my friends had no no problems uh, relating to uh, my observation. It was mostly the resistance of psychiatrists and, and psychologists. Hmm. In would your so one, one more thing one one more thing that of uh, yeah I had uh, uh, so there is the uh, the situation that Kuhn described that during the time when you have uh, the science dominated by a paradigm. Uh, the scientists do what he called uh, um, normal science, which is problem solving within the context of uh, given parameters. It's like playing chess. If you play chess, you have to follow the rules. You can't suddenly take an un- inconvenient uh, figure and throw it out of the uh, out of the chessboard. Uh, you know. Uh, and then he describes uh, what happens, and when when. Op- uh, Observations come that challenge the paradigm, how it's uh, uh, rejected initially. People are called crazy or it's called fraud or whatever. And then when it comes, keeps coming, then finally it's the realization there is a problem. And then the wilder theories come and they first they are sort of rejected. And then after a while, the new paradigm emerges and is accepted by the scientific community. And then history is rewritten because now you have new heroes, people who already saw it, you know, centuries ago, the way we see it now. But uh, what I would like to add was then uh, Gregory Bateson uh, added another thing. is is the, uh, not only uh, do the scientists believe in in that uh, paradigm and are committed to it, but they believe that it's an accurate and exhaustive description of reality per se, not a map not the best way we can sort of currently organize the observation that we have. It is a definitive uh, description of how things are. And uh, this, is a co- this is called the confusion between the map and the territory. People like uh, Arthur Korzybski and then Gregory Bateson was very, very big about it. And uh, Gregory was laughing about it. He said, if scientists make uh, errors like that, it can happen that one day they come... Uh, to the restaurant and they eat the menu instead of the dinner. <laughs> the relationship between a paradigm, you know, and uh, the territory that it described is the, is uh, very much like uh, reading the menu. So I, I've I've had this question I wanted to ask this entire conversation since we first started ta- uh, speaking. And uh, let me let me just get my facts straight before I ask it. Are you currently eighty seven? Is that accurate? 
What is your current age? Uh, I just won in the 1st of July. I just was, uh, was uh, 87. 87. Well, happy belated birthday. And Thank you. Thank you very much. You are remarkably... Uh, I mean, incredibly sharp, incredibly energetic. I mean, more so than some twenty-somethings I know. What do you attribute that to? I mean, are, are, and to what factors? I mean, are, are both were both of your parents sharp their entire lives? Uh, I mean, I I aspire. Currently, I'm forty. I'm forty-one, and I would love to have half the energy that you do. <laughs> so, uh, what, well, to, what, to what do you attribute that? It's it's really uh, just I mean, mind blowing to to me. Uh, I, I'm I'm so inspired uh just trying to absorb some of the uh, enthusiasm <laughs> uh, and energy that you have uh, no, in this uh, in this phone in this phone call uh, i think you know part of it is that i'm really really very very uh, deeply uh, committed to this uh, to this uh, idea of uh, these holotropic states to to bring them into psychiatry to bring them into society I had a lot of, uh, you know, meetings with uh, uh, Albert Hoffman, who, who was talking about the new allowances to create a situation where these are integrated into social fabric. They are socially sanctioned that we can sort of use it the way ancient uh, Greeks, the, the allowances uh, uh, mysteries. Uh, you know, uh, you probably know this was done for 2,000 years in Eleusis. Uh, so they had to offer something pretty impressive to to keep the attention of the ancient world and uh, the uh, list of people who have been initiates in these mysteries. It reads like who is who in antiquity. I mean, it includes Plato, Aristotle, uh, Cicero wrote about it. You know, Marcus Aurelius, Pindaros, and, um, uh, all these people. Uh, so we all sort of. Say, you know, the Greeks are very talented, beautiful art, beautiful science, and uh, great ideas. You know, the fact that uh, you know, so many people every five years had uh, some powerful experiences uh, puts it into somewhat different uh, perspective. And uh, Albert Hoffman and uh, Gordon Watson, the one who brought the, the mushrooms from Mexico, from the Mazatec Indians, and Karl Rugg, uh, a Greek scholar, they wrote the book, uh, wrote to Eleusis, when they found out that the key to these mysteries was Kikeon, K-Y-K-E-O-N. And they uh, uh, found out that this was a, a psychedelic uh, potion, which was made of uh, of ergot, very similar to LSD. So, if you can imagine, uh, if so many people every five years in that small world had psychedelic experiences, that it could have had some uh, impact on the... Uh, on the culture, you know, the last time when we were in uh, in Eleusis, uh, there was a uh, guide, and there are the the ruins of uh, of the Telestrion, which is the the building where this was happening, and it's a gigantic building. And I asked how many people were having these experiences here at a time. He said, at least you know, in the in the last stage, three thousand people. Every five years, we're getting this uh, this wow. dose of this. Uh, so uh, you know, when I when I read Plato now, I don't see him like pacing in the academy and saying, "Let me see how the world works." You know, we have not done this, but there's this level of the, with the archetypes and so on. This is something that you can exp- you can experience archetypes in a, in psychedelic sessions. So these are all all uh, the philosophy was inspired by by psychedelic experiences. What do you what do you think humanity n- needs most right now in in your opinion? If uh, it's what, big, what big, humanity? Big question. Yeah. What 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 do you think humanity needs most right now? What we need? Yeah. If there's any particular well, type of change or shift that you, you, know, that you haven't I, mentioned. I think, well, we. I think you know the. Uh, the monistic materialistic paradigm, I think, is de- really destroying this uh, uh, this planet. And we have, uh, you know, we have lost experiential spirituality. That, that people have really the experience to have uh, have uh, spiritual experiences, which are non-denominational, which are uh, non-chauvinistic, non-sectarian, which are universal, all-inclusive, all. Uh, all uh, uh, embracing 
so people who have these these direct uh, spiritual experiences they they don't uh, experience division in the world you know the, what happened with the with the great organized religions is that they they uh, unite people who are willing to see it the same way and worship the same way uh, but at the same time divide the world because they set it against another group which have uh, taken sort of different archetypes and different uh, different ways of worshiping so then you have a situation where you know we are Christians, uh, you all other guys are pagans, and this, we really have to convert you, or there's really not a good place for you here. Or we are uh, Muslims, and you guys all are infidels. Let go, let have sacred war against the infidels. You know, we have Jews, you are goyim, and so on. And then you have even these kinds of divisions within the same religion. There's centuries of bloodshed between Protestants and, uh, and Catholics. And you have the same with the Sunnis and uh, the Shia. They, they're killing each other, destroying their own temples. Now, these are not religions that will help us in the situation in the world. Uh, but this is very different with the with spirituality, which is really taking taking everything in, and it changes, changes you know, consciousness in a way that people embrace the, uh, the ecological movement, they realize we have to treat nature in a different way because we are so vitally embedded and, and, and entangled in, in nature that we would not use nature as commodity, you know, something that should serve us uh, uh, and uh, the expense of, of you know, destroying, destroying our uh, environment. This, uh, this, you know, nothing that's more important for us. We are biological creatures. We, we need air. We need water. And we need clean soil where we are growing our food. It's 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 uh, so so suicidal, so self-destructive to destroy the basis on which we depend. As a you know, there should not be anything keeping the uh, environment supporting uh, life. No no you know economic uh, profit. No no political. No no military other. We should really realize that we are in the same boat. And, uh, you know, whoever is destroying the environment is is uh, destroying us. And there are many places people can find, of course, your writing and more about you, stanislavgroff.com. I'll link to all of this in the show notes for people, so they'll be able to find that at tim.blog forward slash podcast. And uh, I certainly recommend that people check out your books, uh, including When the Impossible Happens. I, a friend of mine who's involved in scientific research recommended I read The Cosmic Game, and uh, I'm wondering if, before we wrap up, maybe could you share one more story, uh, any story that, that uh, to folks out there who are wondering if there might be more to the story than just the, the purely material, sort of uh, hyper-rational, uh, materialistic worldview. There might just be more to the story. I'm wondering if there's anything else that you can share. I remember the coming across the pig goddess story. I mean, there are so many to choose from, uh, but I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, if... uh, let, me, let me do one that's kind of, I think, is, uh, you know, has a larger kind of uh, importance than, than just mentioning one, one clinical story. It's also a story from when the impossible happens, and it has to do with the experience that I had in a peyote ceremony. So uh, when I came to the United States, you know, I heard about uh, peyote and so on. I never had a chance being in in uh, Czechoslovakia and not having the possibility of, of traveling to have the peyote experience. So I was very, very interested in that. And we had this uh, program for professionals, um, one of the programs at uh, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, and uh, the, one of the persons who came was uh, Ken Godfrey, who was the psychiatrist at the VA hospital in Topeka, Kansas. He was himself, uh, you know, Native American, and his wife was Native American. And he was running a, a psychedelic program in, in, uh, in Topeka. Uh, but he didn't have anybody to sit for him, so he came for his own session. And I sat in his three psychedelic sessions, so, you know, we became very, very close. And so when, uh, after his last session, we were talking, I said, Ken, is there any possibility you can get me into a Native American church uh, ceremony? And he said, I will try. 
And then he called in a few days and say, you know, I talked to uh, the road chief uh, and you can come and you can bring uh, four of your friends. So anyway, we sort of got into the airplane and, and flew to Topeka and then drove into to the middle of the, uh, you know, Kansas prairie there. And there were these teepees and uh, this, uh, this ceremony was being prepared. And we had to go through kind of a clearance that they wanted to find out what kind of people we were. We had to tell them about ourselves. And we got just a lot of aggressive comments from them about uh, how, you know, white people came and they have... Uh, they have uh, taken their land. They have uh, killed their buffalo. They have killed their, their warriors. They have raped uh, their women and so on. And uh, so there was a, it was sort of like, almost like an encounter group. And as we were going on, they were sort of finding out that we were okay and one after another that, that we can participate. And at the end, there was just one very sort of dark, sullen man who wouldn't have any of us. We had We were like pale faces and that was it you know he's not going to have us in the sacred ceremony and then he get onto a lot of peer pressure it was time to start and people say come on you know let it go and so he did say yes but it was really no and i was uh, in the tp i was sitting uh, across him and then uh, the the buttons peyote buttons were were uh, passed and uh, then it started coming on and he sort of was really like radiating like a, a laser beam toward me. You know, the hatred was kind of, and everything was amplified, of course, by the, by a peyote. And we were doing the rounds when you pass a staff and a, a drum. And every time you get it, you can say something, you can sing a song or invite people to do something or make a confession or whatever. But you can also pass. And every time it came to him, he would grab it and push it. And he just would not participate. And so we were all these rounds, and we were going through the last last round, um, where everybody can say something. And uh, Bob Lehi, who was a, another LSD therapist from uh, from Maryland, working with us, Helen Bonney uh, and her sister. Helen Bonney was our music therapist, and Walter Houston Clark was a very famous uh, professor of religion. And uh, so as we were doing the last round, uh, Walter Houston Clark uh, gave this, you know, almost like masochistic uh, kind of a speech. He said, how wonderful it was from your, you know, brothers and sisters to take us into the sacred ceremony after what we have done to you. We have killed your buffalo and your warriors and raped your women and taken your spirituality and then somehow, uh, I don't remember except exactly the context, he mentioned me and said, especially Stan here, who is so far from his native Czechoslovakia. And suddenly when he mentioned that, it was like a lightning hit this guy. And he started shaking. He got up, he threw himself into my lap, uh, put, put his uh, head into my lap. Uh, sort of snot was, uh, tears were running out of his eyes and, and uh, you know, uh, snot out of his nose. It, it became like one of our workshops, doing sort of close work with people. And everybody was watching. Nobody knew what was happening. And this was happening for a while. And then he got up and... Uh, went back to his place, sit down, and then not, not talking, just sitting there. And there was like a lot of, lot of pressure, you know, psychological pressure, people, people wanting to know what was happening. And then he said, you know, uh, I have to say something horrible. I thought you were all Americans. I didn't know Stan was from Czechoslovakia. You know, the Czechs are not known as your archetypal raiders of the Wild West, exactly. <laughs> So his, I, I treated him uh, as, as if he were an American, and I hated him through the whole ceremony. And uh, it's just more, more than I can, uh, I can take, you know. And uh, then was sitting there, and uh, it was clear that something more was coming. And then he said, but it's worse than that. During the Second World War, I was drafted in the American Air Force, and I was personally present in uh, the air raid on his city. There was five days before the end of the war, there was an American uh, attack on Pilsen that destroyed the automobile factory there and damaged Pilsen. So I said, he stayed home, but I went and I killed his people. Our roles were reversed, and that's just too much for me. And then he got up and he went to the four Americans there and embraced them. He says, 
uh, you are not my enemies. You are you are my friend. He says we are all in the same boat. We if we if we hold the old grudges, uh, we we all die. We have we are all you know uh, children of of uh, Mother Earth, and we have to we have to sort of uh, uh, really sort of learn how to how to live with each, with each other and how to love each other. And then he ended in his says. Well, they believe in reincarnation. So, that, well, and for what I can say, when this was happening, I might have been on the other side. And, uh, you know, we were still still under the influence of peyote, so we were all crying and sort of embracing each other. And that uh, atmosphere of reconciliation was amazing. I actually told that uh, story at, uh, at the end of uh, the International Transpersonal Conference in Prague, when I was bringing transpersonal psychology back to Prague, because we had all these you know, European nations that had all kinds of grudges and really didn't like each other. Like we were occupied by Nazi Germany for six years. You know, a lot of people killed, ended up in concentration camps. Then we had years of uh, uh, communist uh, regime, so nobody liked uh, Russia. None, none of the people from the Eastern European <laughs> countries liked either Russia or or Germany. We had sort of German and Jews there. And uh, uh, what was amazing that we did a large holotropic breathwork, uh, you know, not before the conference, as a, as a pre-conference workshop. And it was amazing how within within two days, I mean, some of these boundaries were were uh, melting and, you know, people embracing each other and uh, sitting for each other. And when people were owning their own uh, emotional problems, they actually activated the best in, in other people. And in spite of language difficulties and so on, there was really a change of the, of the atmosphere uh, from, you know, all these antagonisms that were certainly in the air at the beginning. What a wonderful story. So, so anyway, that's my story. Thank you so I much. I call it less, Lesson in Forgiveness. I think we could all use Lessons in Forgiveness, not only towards others, but towards ourselves. And uh, I really want to express gratitude uh, and thanks, certainly uh, for the experiences that I've had, which have been informed by your writing and uh, people who have uh, indirectly or directly been trained by you in some respects. And uh, to thank you on behalf of no doubt, many people who are listening who have had similar experiences and uh, I'm very, I'm very cautiously optimistic about this, this Renaissance that we're witnessing and hopefully we won't repeat some of the same mistakes that, that appear to have been made. Uh, But the social circumstances are so different and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, I certainly hope this isn't our last conversation, uh, but uh, I, I want to be respectful of your time. And we've we've gone for quite quite a bit already today. Is there anything else that you would like to say uh, to the people listening uh, or ask uh, of them before we before we end this particular conversation? Well, maybe repeat you know what Carl Gustav Jung said, and that I would really certainly endorse that. Uh, it's important that we live our life not just sort of by responding to what is happening outside of us, but spending some time in some kind of focused uh, self-exploration and uh, that can lead to inner transformation. So we live our life as a synthesis of what we see outside and what comes from within. He would say you, you uh, get lessons from what he called the self, the higher higher aspect of our our personality. So you know part of the part of the problem of the industrial civilization we lost this uh, this uh, tradition uh, of if you want of psychonautics all the other groups of uh, humanity way back probably into the paleolithic they were they were using uh, these holotropic states for healing for uh, you know transformation for the main main uh, vehicle for ritual uh, spiritual uh, life they were using it for a lot of uh, practical things for as an inspiration for for art and so on so uh, i see this uh, this tremendous renaissance that is happening now not just as correcting of these uh, of these you know uh, uh, really uh, 
ter terrible administrative uh, legal mistakes that were done that stopped the research for 40 years, a return to the research. Uh, I see it also as uh, the the possibility of the industrial civilization to join the rest of uh, humanity that always was combining somehow the the uh, spiritual inner spirit spiritual experiences with whatever they were doing in the in the external uh, world. Well, thank you so much, so, Stan. Uh, uh, again, uh, Tim, thank you so much for everything you have been you have been doing and. Uh, Thank you for this for this opportunity to, you know, share some of uh, my life with with your listeners. Oh, it's with you. It's such a pleasure, and uh, I can only aspire to uh, contribute in some small way. Uh, and you, you, I'm excited to see uh, what you do from this point forward. And you seem to have as much energy as ever traveling around the world doing what you do. And, um, I hope we can have many, many more conversations. And, uh, but, but for today, I want to be, uh, respectful of, of your time since uh, you do have so many things going on. And I will certainly in the show notes to everybody listening, uh, link to everything we've discussed, all of the books, the different websites, foundations, and so on. And you can find all those at tim.blog forward slash podcast. Uh, Stan, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Again, it's a wonderful. It's great to have a, a, an interviewer, you know, who, who knows what we are talking about. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't always happen. <laughs> this, this was one of the great ones. Thank uh, you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And to everybody listening, keep your mind open and look outside but also look inside as Stan mentioned and until next time thank you for listening hey guys this is Tim again just a few more things before you take off number one this is five bullet Friday do you want to get a short email from me would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend and five bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by LegalZoom, which more than 2 million Americans have used to help start their businesses. Past guests even, such as well, WordPress lead developer, CEO of Automatic, Matt Mullenweg, now valued at more than a billion dollars, have used LegalZoom to help with their business needs, specifically in his case, to form his company. But LegalZoom isn't just for launching your business. Their services include everything from helping you to manage changing tax laws, reviewing contracts, creating NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, important stuff, handling lease agreements, and assisting with really any other legal challenge, hurdle, inconvenience that typically takes time and effort away from running your business. The best part is that you won't get charged by the hour because LegalZoom isn't a law firm, so they won't be running the clock up and spinning circles just to raise your bill. Instead, they just ask you to pay one low upfront price for whatever it is that you're looking to get a la carte style. So visit LegalZoom.com and check out their business section for all of their services. And if you want special savings, that's the terminology in the copy that they suggest. I don't know what the special savings is, folks, but it's titillating. If you want special savings, enter promo code TIM, T-I-M, at checkout, capital T, lowercase I-M. Again, take a peek, LegalZoom.com, and enter promo code TIM. This episode is brought to you by Peloton, which I've been using probably for about a year now. Peloton is a cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right into your home. You can also do on-demand, which is what I do. We'll come back to that. So you don't have to worry about fitting classes into a busy schedule or making it to a studio or gym with a hectic or unpredictable commute. I, for instance, have a Peloton bike right in my master bedroom at home, and it's one of the first things I do many mornings. I wake up, I meditate for a bit, 
Then I knock out a short 20 minute ride in my undies. Hard to do that at the gym. Take a shower and I'm in higher gear for the rest of the day. It's really convenient and has become something that I look forward to. So you have a lot of options. For one, if you'd like, you can ride live with thousands of other riders across the country on an interactive leaderboard to keep you motivated. There are also up to 14 new classes added every day with more than 8,000 classes on demand. And you can pick based on length, 45 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, music, hip hop, rock and roll, or say low impact versus high intensity or interval. You can pick the class structure and style that works for you. And in my case, I quite like Matt Wilpers, and I tend to do on-demand and listen to a lot of and watch many of the same classes over and over, but I'm kind of promiscuous and also enjoy classes from a lot of the other instructors. They have Peloton, an amazing roster of incredible instructors in New York City with a whole range of styles and personalities, so you can find what you're in the mood for. You also get real-time metrics that you can use to track your performance over time, and that will help I would say catalyze you to beat your personal best. Now that all sounds good, right? Gamification, yada, yada, yada. I didn't think that it would work for me or in any way incentivize me, but they really 100% hit the nail on the head. I was very, very impressed with how motivating it was. And it worked tremendously to keep me pushing, uh, which quite honestly takes a fair amount. I can get quite lazy, particularly with anything that edges on endurance, which is kind of more than five reps of anything for me. So... Check it out. Discover this cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings the studio experience right to your home. Peloton is offering listeners of this podcast a limited-time offer. Go to OnePeloton.com. That's O-N-E, Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com, and enter the code TIM, all caps, at checkout, and get $100 off of accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. So get a great workout at home anytime you want. Check it out. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the code TIM to get started.